Okay, we're live. Um, hello, friends. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Since uh, 2013, we've been making high quality knowledge easily accessible and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. For us, um, the qualification to be a leader was um, just taking a step towards finding solutions to and through waste. And, and for us, a leader doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and at any point in their lives or professions. And um, as you know, you might know that no single community or person has a monopoly on leadership. Uh, and all you need is to be able to wish to make change. And uh, if not for our work, most of this information would have uh, stayed immobilized or landfill in lengthy PDFs um, without any use to anyone, or all of this information would have been limited to expensive international conferences. So um, we're extremely happy about the impact we've been creating, but um, this is just a drop in the ocean compared to the scale of challenges we face, which, uh, which are all planetary. Um, for example, climate change, public health, or um, plastics, um, plastics pollution in the oceans. Now, um, our generation, we have our battles to fight. Uh, we'll have many heroes, successes, and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those um, who are not ready yet, um, take your time. And when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you take the next step. And I'll be here to help in any other way possible. Now, coming to uh, Be Waste Wise activities, um, in, in addition to the Global Dialogue on Waste, which happens every year, we also publish um, the Waste Pioneers list. It's a list of uh, organizations and individuals who are doing amazing work with social media, who are doing very good work in sharing their stories on social media. And uh, once the list is published, we also um, organize uh, Q&A sessions with them and interviews with them. Um, so those are also published. Please check them out. Um, and um, we also have a, a weekly interview series with uh, the individual waste pioneers coming up soon. So um, stay stay um, sub subscribe um, to our newsletter and uh, follow us on social media so that you're updated. And um, for for any of you who are listening in, if you if you uh, if you were a contributor to Be Waste Wise, if you were a panelist at some point, um, uh, we run something called the community newsletter. So we uh, if you have any updates. If you have any articles, if you have any uh, work-related uh, achievements, share them with us, and then we'll share them with the uh, com with our community. Um, and uh, finally, um, I've been um, seeking actively. Uh, I've been actively seeking employment, and while I was doing that, I realized that there is no single platform or single place where we could um, find uh, we could find good opportunities in waste management and international development in waste management. So uh, because of that, we thought, you know, we would just add one more drop in the ocean by um, asking you to send us uh, any job opportunities you have so that we can share them on our LinkedIn group and also share them through our newsletter with everyone so that they have a uh, better chance uh, of getting all of this news in, in one place. So um, <clears throat> finally, coming to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Ways. We have about um, 310 registrations for all four um, um, days combined. So uh, we're extremely happy about this. And um, this is uh, uh, a th thank you for, for um, joining us. And um, in addition to this, we also have uh, three viewing sessions. So these are people from around the world who you know get their friends and um, colleagues together to watch these um, sessions together and also have a group come together um, with the global dialogue on waste as an occasion. And uh, today we have um, uh, Narsinga Pani Grahi from uh, Bhubaneswar, Orissa in India. Um, he organized a viewing session uh, with his uh, friends and colleagues. Um, and uh, he represents uh, uh, an organization called SDRC and SGR. And SDRC works on uh, um, so, social issues and uh, SGR works on recycling in uh, in, um, in 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 Orissa and he got um, other friends and colleagues who are interested in circular economy and waste management and they're they're watching this live and they'll be able to submit their questions to us uh, while while we're during the session so 
with all of that, um, today we have uh, Brian McCarthy with us, um, and uh, he he's an independent consultant. He also works with RWA Advisors. And uh, in today's session, we'll be covering the types of challenges practitioners like him who are in the, at the front line face. And, um, and we'll also understand why and how they choose certain paths or take certain decisions. And um, we believe instead of just knowing what certain countries do or practitioners do, for example, they do so-and-so technologies or they do so-and-so um, methodologies, instead of just knowing what, we believe it's much more useful to others, other practitioners in waste management to understand why and how these practitioners take those decisions. So um, with that, I welcome uh, Brian to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Hi, Brian. Uh, welcome. Hello, Ranjith. Thanks for your introduction and uh, thanks very much for your contribution to the Global Waste Management uh, Challenge. I've got to congratulate you and the Be Waste Wise uh, initiative. Um, I think it's a fantastic initiative to share and disseminate knowledge, which is uh, really important. And as you say, a lot of information is tied up within uh, PDFs and various computers around the world and never really get disseminated to the, the real people in the field that need to know it and need to work with it. So congratulations. Great initiative. Um, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, so. Um, uh, starting with the, um, today's um, session, so can you tell tell everyone a little bit about your work? You know how you got into this, and what kind of work you're doing right now, and you know what drives you. You you, you know you, you spend quite a bit of time on the field. So what drives you? Yeah, so I got into waste management. I guess I guess going way back to when I was a young boy. My father worked for uh, large container ships, shipping companies. He was a, a civil uh, chief engineer on some of the largest container ships in the world. So, uh, and I used to sail with him um, from Britain to Hong Kong and uh, through um, the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, around India, and stopping off at all these ports around the world. And I guess that really inspired my introduction to the living environment and, and um, our, our human interactions with the environment and trade and global trade and globalization, um, which is really where a lot of our waste management challenges come from. Is Waste is a, a byproduct of consumption and uh, the global production and consumption and globalization is really um, pushed um, our production to a level in which our waste production is at levels never seen before. Um, so at a very young age, I got introduced to the very tight um, living environment of a ship and what the waste and, and, and the services within a small community living as an island in the ocean for months at end. But then stopping at these huge cities, huge ports, and seeing the global trade and the and the different levels of municipal development within the, each of these, and then over years seeing the development in Kuala Lumpur, in Chennai, and in, in various uh, ports that we stopped at, and Hong Kong, um, and uh, and that spurred me on to go to university study environmental engineering and science and. Uh, and then after university, I got um, compulsory mobilized with the military to go to Iraq, um, where after initial uh, months with the, as a, a traditional military role, I got put in charge of waste management, given my background in Basra. Um, because with the fall of the Ba'athist regime and the sanctions, the UN sanctions that were on uh, Iraq at the time, prior to the 2003 invasion, um, suddenly these sanctions were lifted and we got this huge influx of trade into a society that was previously very much self-sustaining and thus very little consumption, new consumption, new uh, goods coming in in which to produce the waste uh, or, or uh, become waste. And so suddenly you got this huge influx of waste into the society, into the cities and, and a huge influx of wealth, uh, monetary uh, influx as development aid was pushed into the cities and the country as a whole. And so we saw a dramatic, a, a, a drop of um, waste production um, during the 2003 invasion, but then a sudden very rapid climb in waste production as consumption increased. Um, and so I, I was 
uh, kind of put in charge of um, developing a strategy for the south of Iraq, which was picked up. And I eventually I spent about five years in Iraq in different locations and different levels, working with municipal um, officials and rebuilding their capacity, um, as well as the, 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 the institutional capacity, as well as the technical capacity to deliver services, um, which is vitally important in stabilizing a, a, a fragile state. Um, if the, the majority of the population are not at war, they are living their normal lives. And if they do not have a safe and clean environment in which to bring up their children and to live their lives, then the, the uh, society can break down and, and resent and, and run against the government. So it's a very important aspect of a stable society is having this clean municipal environment. So that's really where my beginnings uh, were. Then I went on to Sweden and did my uh, master's in environmental management and policy at Lund University and uh, subsequently worked in Britain and for a consultancy in Britain uh, for a couple of years before returning to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And I did about uh, roughly uh, almost five years in Afghanistan working on similar issues. Um, very exciting. Uh, people ask me, oh, God, you, it, it must be bad working in Iraq, Afghanistan during war. But like I say, society is still functioning in, in war-torn areas and, and fragile states. And, and the majority of the people want nothing more than a stable environment in which to bring their families up and, and in which to live. And so working with those people was just fantastic. And um, one of my colleagues from the project in, in Iraq, a USAID funded project in Kandahar. My colleague is now, a local colleague, is now the mayor of Kandahar and really driving forward a lot of um, the work that we did in terms of waste management municipal service delivery there. And that's very rewarding to see um, a colleague go on and move on to a position of real influence in the community. Um, and since then, uh, so I finished there in 2000. Uh, 14, I guess, or 2013-14, and uh, since then I've mainly been working on the African continent, um, South Africa, Ethiopia was the first major project, and similar challenges, um, transitional economies, um, so not strictly war-torn, but very um, transitional and, and rapidly, economically rapidly growing, and as a result, um, waste production rapidly growing, and um, the capabilities, both technological um, and institutional and financial capabilities to deal with that rapid growth in waste production uh, rarely exists in transitional economies. So working with them to build that, very rewarding. Again, it's not like working in Europe where it's quite confined. The rules and regulations are already there, so you've got very little room to to devise something new and innovative. There are, there is ways, definitely, there's still innovative uh, innovations going on in Europe, but when you've got a black blank canvas on which to work with, it's uh, a little bit more exciting and um, rewarding, I guess. You see quite dramatic changes rather than having to wait the long time to see it slowly pass through the bureaucratic systems. So yeah, so recently we've been working in uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, um, Zimbabwe, um, also in Europe and Albania, um, we had a big tour uh, project there, and in U uh, Cyprus, in which we are working with an EU pro funded program to try and bring up northern Cyprus, uh, which is officially part of Europe, um, but governed um, autonomously, um, right. bringing them up to European standards. So that's where we are at the moment. Right. Um, so uh, I think we can just say that you're uh, much more adventurous than most of us um, working in the sector. Um, and um, um, one thing you observe, which is, um, you know, you uh, get uh, wealth and trade first and then waste management increases. I, I mean, we've seen this um, all over the world, you know, um, when it's important to uh, address poverty. And once we start addressing poverty through, you know, trade and growth, then um, it, it, that during that time, when we are addressing poverty, we need um, infrastructure like water, um, roads, and you know energy. 
But then with some lag, once the trade kicks in, then we see waste management increasing. So the need for waste management increasing. So um, it's an interesting, but I think in the areas that you work in, um, I think it's much more uh, rapid um, in, in conflict ridden zones or in, in underdeveloped. So uh, in um, underdeveloped uh, economies. So um, so this this would have really given you a good um, view at uh, what kind of impact uh, uh, foreign aid uh, that's put in a certain um, area has on the local uh, infrastructure, local waste management infrastructure. And um, this is something we've been talking um, about earlier. So uh, do you think you can um, tell us a little bit about what kind of impacts uh, foreign aid has on local infrastructure, how it impacts in, in, in good ways and bad ways? Yeah, definitely. Uh, foreign aid is an incredibly difficult topic. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of uh, research and, and, and opinions about whether foreign aid, where it should be directed, how much should be directed where. Um, and, and when it should be delivered and when it should be cut off. Um, it, it's a very difficult um, topic. But um, so, so we have different aspects of foreign aid. We have um, just general international development and, and, and themed aid. So, so where aid is specifically targeted to develop um, waste management or municipal services, or where it's targeted as the economic growth or stabilization initiatives um, so they, they have different impacts I think all foreign aid um, influences the local economy which as a result influences the, the, the money circulating on the local economy which impacts how much waste is produced and in general increases the waste that is produced and, and changes the type of waste that's there as the economy grows as, as aid um, aid finances are channeled to different areas you can see examples uh, if there's a water shortage or a water problem uh, aid can often come in the form of of physical water bottles and so you see a huge explosion of the amount of plastic there and then when the aid cuts off the plastic is no longer there and so you you have this um huge um residual um material to deal with but it's not a sustainable business uh, a sustainable business can't be set up to deal with that waste stream because it's only a very um, short piece of period of time in which that um, material is is put onto the market and becomes waste but I guess it, focusing on where aid is focused on waste management we see a lot of aid focused on um, Assisting, I mean, if, if I go around Ethiopia, um, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, Eth Egypt, Iraq, all those, Albania, um, all those countries, and, and indeed Cyprus, all those countries have received aid in the way of a loan or a grant to establish um, um, sanitary landfill sites. Um, and, and it's it's a push i think partly driven by the un and, and and potentially the sustainable development goals are really driving this um sustainable goal 11 on uh, improving waste ma uh, municipal services into cities um we see a lot of a lot of aid money f focused on growing aid the 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 Aid agencies or the, the donor agencies or the, the national agencies come in and they, they look at the environment, they look at the city, what do you need? Oh, we've got a dump site that's burning. And they say, okay, well, our environmental policy says that you should have, uh, uh, our, our aid can only be spent on um, items that are within our environmental policy terms. So that generally means a sanitary landfill means a geomembrane, a full, uh, fully lined um, sanitary landfill with leachate treatment system, uh, generally a mechanized leachate treatment system, but not always, but quite often that there's a, a discharge limit um, and that is tied into the aid bodies um, environmental policy. 
so, 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 so something that they're in my uh, or, or their um, decision makers can support because you know that's what fits their environmental policy. Uh, so yeah. they would say that you would have to um, convert your open dump site, which is burning, into something like this, so that we can support you. Yeah. So for yes, exactly. Um, so an example would be in in Afghanistan and Kandahar when I was there. Uh, it was a municipal a municipal development program, so it was involved in all municipal services and uh, all aspects of municipal uh, institutional and technical. But one of the biggest problems was that the waste was being dumped in the dry river bed in Kandahar and, and other um, cities in the area. But I'll choose Kandahar as the biggest city in the south in the area I was working. And the USAID uh, was the donor agency. Their environmental policy says for a landfill to be built, you need to have a full environmental impact assessment by a third party. And it has to comply with US EPA standards. And that's what we were told was the requirement if we wanted to do a landfill. So we couldn't, we we needed a place to take the waste to 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 in, to teach the municipality. Okay, the waste doesn't get dumped in the dry riverbed. It has to go into a designated place, uh, a, a properly controlled disposal site. But the municipality couldn't fund a landfill and couldn't establish another facility without our assistance they just didn't have the financial means um, and we couldn't build a, a sanitary landfill because we just didn't have the funds a third party capable of doing a full EIA would have cost far more than the actual physical construction of the landfill because the capacity didn't exist in Afghanistan to do an EIA and, and to bring one in with all the security and everything just would have been ridiculous. So we had to be innovative. And, um, and so we, instead of building a sanitary landfill or a landfill, we built a transitional waste accumulation site. So we just changed the name and said it's transitional in nature because of the composition of the waste. It's very organic. We're going to build a semi-aerobic uh, transitional accumulation site for the waste to accumulate um, and basically it was a semi-aerobic landfill but with the idea that the waste will decompose quickly and it can be mined and and, uh, and converted into compost at a later stage um, and therefore um, get around these rules but other places we can't get around those rules um, we were I was again in Iraq at the end of last year um, in the northern Iraq in, in Kurdish area and there there was a dump site on fire uh, so so um, uh, aid money had established a mechanical and biological treatment facility with a sanitary landfill uh, beside it uh, incredible expense 19 million euros or so and um, the sanitary landfill, which cost its, itself about seven million, um, had had been on fire. They just they, they hadn't had the, the capacity, the skill set to um, to operate the landfill in accordance with uh, the needs of that site. And the waste had gone on fire, and the the, the liner had burnt out. So all that money had been wasted. But beside it, most of the waste was still going to a dump site that was on fire. And during that time, another um, national aid uh, agency came along and said, we want to support you. Um, what can we do? They said, well, the dump site's on fire. Um, it's producing a lot of leachate also. We've also got the sanitary landfill and we want to improve its management and start using it. But it had already been burnt out. The liner had gone. I, it was the majority of the waste was in the dump site. But this aid agency, um, within its environmental policy, couldn't do anything that was out with of their environmental policy. So their um, assessment identified the need for treating the leachate from the sanitary landfill. And so they spent another 2 million euros establishing a reverse osmosis uh, leachate treatment plant because that was the only system that could meet their environment, the aid agency, I won't name that, the aid agency's um, environmental standards for discharge wow. limit. And so another 2 million in aid 
mm. to waste, which can be which is proportioned to the waste or municipal services sector of that nation's aid uh, receipt is wasted. The reverse osmosis is will never be sustained because it's <clears throat> is an expensive t treatment. They didn't have the, the the finance to maintain the landfill as it was, right? And right. so, introducing this additional expense of operating and maintaining a reverse osmosis plant was just ne is never going to be sustained, right? But right. this aid is is tied. This aid agency is tied to the environmental policy of the, their national standards. So that's a case where aid is a, the politicians can stand up and say we have received or we have spent this amount of money on uh, the municipal infrastructure and waste management to assist it but it's complete waste and right, right. I see so many instances of this and and so that's that's kind of aid wasted similarly around the world we see um, the national level politicians saying, okay, we need sanitary landfills in every city. So, um, Brian, Brian, yeah. Yeah. I want to um, talk about that and also mention the Ghazipur landfill site. Um, so um, as I think that that's uh, very much related to, you know, what you're going to talk and also talk a little bit about the CAPEX and OPEX, you know, you get foreign aid for CAPEX, but not, you know, for the OPEX. So let's yeah. talk about that. But uh, let me just um, remind um, everyone who's viewing that um, you're watching the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. And this is uh, Practicing Waste Management. We have Brian McCarthy with us. And um, we also have a viewing session where um, Narsingh Apani Grahi from SDRC and SGR, um, he's gotten a bunch of his friends and uh, colleagues to watch it. And they'll be able to um, submit questions here. And um, you can also uh, submit your questions by using the question and answer box below the screen. And uh, um, depending on how much time we have, we'll, uh, we'll you know, try to answer all of them. And um, so, uh, Brian, um, you know about the Ghazipur uh, landfill site um, disaster, which happened just this week. And um, when something like this happens, then there's a, a, always an outcry from the public and from media and from politicians, you know, who are trying to, uh, you know, politicize it. Um, there's a, a cry for, you know, better waste management techniques and then to uh, to jump from uh, open dump to something much more advanced. I think this is something that we'll be talking with Andy in the next 45 minutes. But, you know, there's a huge demand for to do something like that. So which is slightly different from what you've been talking where, you know, the aid agency has uh, certain restrictions, but then here it comes from public and, you know, from within the country. Um, so um, in such cases, you know, um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, how do you deal with it as a practitioner? You know, how, how are you supposed to think about this? Um, yeah, so um, mega cities are a very difficult uh, problem. The waste management in mega cities is, is an incredibly difficult problem. but similarities between dump sites in uh, Delhi to to dump sites in a secondary city, a smaller city in, uh, in Zimbabwe, where the economy is restricted. Many of the, the problems come from dump sites are, are relatively or are very cheap to to run and operate uh, or to, to as a, a very cheap disposal route for cities and because they are so cheap financially cheap not not economically because the economic impact is actually huge but it's not um accounted for in the finances locally um because they are financially cheap to operate it means that nothing can really compete with them so recycling or or um Advanced. We will. You will speak. You'll speak later with Agri Protein and and um, Christian Chris Zuber uh, on uh, the Black Fly, Black Soldier Fly, um, evolving or, or or emerging techniques for dealing with uh, the various waste streams. They can't compete with open dumping or dump sites because it, they cost. There's a cost associated with establishing the capital investment cost, the operational cost. Whereas dump sites are just too cheap. 
and and I think it's a problem with municipalities and governments just not allocating appropriate funding for the or or not uh, enforcing um standards at these dump sites i actually think a lot of dump sites are actually an asset to to towns especially emerging economies in emerging economies the dump site shouldn't be seen as all bad it should just be incrementally improved through um enforcing um operational standards that would be expected on a sanitary landfill anyway and this is why i have a big problem with international aid just going in and establishing sanitary landfills without first saying right you prove to us that you can operate the dump site that you have to a standard which if you have it a sanitary landfill will be required to establish it because there's so many millions of euros dollars invested into sanitary landfills around the world and they just fall into disrepair fall into disposal sites very rapidly because the skill set and the, the operational financing is not there so i think this is the same as as happened um in the gazipur landfill is it there's just not the the, the operational financing and and the, the the strategic thinking of looking beyond uh, to the next step and just seeing it as a cheap way and overloading it with waste because it is a cheap way of disposing of the waste that causes the problems we've got and it means because it's cheap because we don't invest in the enforcement of investment in the operation and maintenance of these facilities nothing else can compete so our black soldier fly can't compete our recycling industries can't compete our biogas can't compete nothing can compete with the cheapness of this and so you get these sites overfilled and then collapse the same happened in addis ababa 170 people killed last the beginning of this year um and it's just happening more and more often because these sites are just getting overloaded because they're so cheap as a waste disposal mechanism. And then people stand up and say, oh, well, we need waste to energy. It's not a solution. I think waste to energy is, is push, sweeping the problem under the, the carpet, as it were. Um, again, you, who's going to pay for the finance, the operational finance of that? But also it doesn't address our overproduction and overconsumption of unsustainable materials that become waste so quickly. If you have waste to energy, you're, uh, the EPR schemes and the, the, the systems we have in Europe in which we have a large, Sweden is often seen as the best country for or a shining light for waste management in the world, the, some, uh, the utopia, but really it does the systems we have here in Europe and, and uh, they do nothing to stop the increase in unsustainable products entering the market that quickly be, and packaging in particular epr schemes that address packaging they do nothing to really change the the material and the, the amount the volumes of waste that are entering the market and it's not an op it's not a solution. We have to really go back to the manufacturing, go back to where does the waste come from? And I think that's something that the circular economy is trying to address, going to try and address. Um, um, but will it? Has, is it going far enough to address the real um, economics of the entire global uh, consumption and production, production and consumption? Right, I don't right. think it does. Right. right. Um, uh, we have a question here. Um, uh, Brian, can you mute mute yourself just for just one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we have a question here from um, Harijan Das, and um, I think what he's asking is: um, so uh, when you're working in conflict um, zones, I mean, are you worried about the amount of land that's used for landfills? Um, and if you are or you're not, you know, what kind of steps can be taken in such situations to reduce the amount of waste that's going to the landfill? That's a good question. Um, the amount of land that's going, uh, this really is geographically um, 
dependent on where you are. Iraq has a fantastic amount of land, and I guess, yeah, there there is there, there's definitely an issue with the land taking up, and that's why I think this dump sites, existing dump sites, are an asset um, in many situations because they have traditionally not been managed properly. And so they take up a large area of land and that land has already been contaminated and already been um, uh, it, it devalued. It's not a valuable resource uh, in terms of uh, economic building um, infrastructure. Um, and so that land can then be used more efficiently as a controlled landfill. And that's where I think we should begin our uh, remediation and, and, and uh, improvements in disposal systems. Um, we can't move directly from uh, dump sites to, to re uh, very efficient recycling or, or uh, advanced waste treatment technologies because it's just free. You're fighting against, a, 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 you're comparing a free disposal system versus a, a, a cost um, uh, base system. So the, the, yeah, the, it really is geographically dependent. Iraq had a lot of land. Afghanistan, southern Afghanistan had a lot of land, but then there's other areas that had a lot of um, cities. Kabul was lacking land. It's in a valley or in a basin, um, surrounded by mountains. And so access to land is a lot more precious, but that should stimulate um, other waste management systems. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, energy from waste incineration. We'll see the black soldier fly later. I think the majority of waste in developing countries is organic and thus um, we should put more emphasis on the enforcement of separation of wet waste or the organic stream versus the other streams and uh, make that a priority rather than uh, investing heavily in infrastructure, invest heavily in uh, enforcement and then hopefully um, economics, free market economics dictate that uh, the private sector should take over if the enforcement of those separation is performed. All right, all right, that sounds good. So, uh, so we, we have another uh, seven minutes. minutes. So, uh, um, we we remark some suggestions for uh, decision makers worldwide, uh, you know, how they could solve these problems that, you know, we um, you know, talked about. Sorry, say that again. Um, so um, we have uh, another seven minutes. So do you have any suggestions or, you know, um, solutions? Uh, oh, um, Brian, actually, uh, there was another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which was the game that you were developing. Um, so um, I know you were using this game um, for um, engaging uh, decision makers in workshops to make them understand, you know, how they could build their own waste management system. So. I thought it was really interesting when you told me about this. So, can you tell us a little bit? Do, uh, do you have anything to show? Um, Ooh, um, that's a good good point. Normally, I do. Uh, okay. I'll do my best. Uh, so, what I have, I'll explain it, <laughs> and then hopefully, I'll remember where I put them. Um, what we have is, we find that in many instances, um, decision makers, there's a whole that all the stakeholders. Um, in the waste management system don't often have full vi visibility of what is available to them to manage the waste. And that includes from, from the very basics of um, a wheelie bin versus a, a, an open uh, metal bin. Um, and um, we also have decision makers, mayors uh, and, and national politicians go on study tours to Europe see oh everybody's got a wheelie bin so we want a wheelie bin at every door in our city in the middle of i don't know um ethiopia the secondary city and they don't see okay the 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 um logic the, the 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 steps that then are required you know a wheelie bin needs to be compatible have a compatible truck to lift it into its truck. Otherwise, these guys are struggling with a big wheelie bin to throw it into the back of an open van. So what we developed was the we started to put together what we call the waste management, waste collection and treatment almanac, which is a, a book or a, a yeah a book of all the different uh, waste collection 
bin types, uh, vehicle types, primary collection vehicle types, secondary collection vehicle bit types, um, secondary um, transfer stations, um, uh, recycling technologies, and just identifying, you know, where's the manufacturers of these equipments, how much is the capital cost, how much is the operational cost, and what other resources are really required. And from that, we, we then developed a card game. And uh, if I can think where I've put the cards, um, we have small cards of each of these technologies. Uh, so from a bin, all the different bin types, all the uh, different primary collection. And we range these, you know, um, there's a huge range we have, um, but then we make them appropriate to the country we're building the capacity in. So, right. you know, a, a, a bicycle, pedal bicycle collection may not be appropriate for, um, for Sweden, uh, but it's appropriate for Delhi. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we, we adjust it to the local context. Yeah. And so we have in the stakeholder workshop, they build their system from bin, bin types based on their waste uh, categorization analysis. Uh, and then they build their system um, right the way through to disposal or treatment. And then they have to cost up the capital cost and the operational cost. Uh, very basic, quick, easy, very visual, what, what equipment's available, what would they choose, what's compatible with what, and then we analyze it. Is this compatible with this? And then they begin to realize, okay, this, is, um, this isn't compatible, this isn't the right, this isn't appropriate for our city or our town, so we'll change that out and make it more affordable. And at the end, they have to cost up the op OPEX and the CAPEX uh, and, and compare it to their available budget. So it's a very quick and easy, very visual and very, um, user uh friendly and, and uh, yeah collaborative right uh, stakeholder dialogue and it says it's been a lot of fun we've we've done it in probably about 10 countries now and every workshop's really enjoyed it all right all right great uh, brian we have a quick question from uh Pavan Jadav, and um he's asking um so for a country like india what would be the best method to collect and treat the leachate from a dump site uh, yeah, India is a difficult one because it's quite um, quite uh, organic waste, uh, hot. Um, uh, well, depending, I mean, India has got such a huge uh, various. But um, generally, you know, if you can go for a low cost biological system, um, if you have the land available, then um, oxidation ponds can be very good um, uh, into a. a, a, a um, active um, reed bed or a, um, a, yeah, reed bed system. Um, but um, yeah, it, it really depends on what expertise exists in the place, in your uh, local uh, e economy. So if reverse osmosis is, is a very good um, way of treating leachate, it's, it's very effective. But if you do not have a supply chain of membranes to replace and, and uh, maintain the skill set to maintain reverse osmosis, then it's totally useless. But if you do have that skill set in the town and in, in the local economy, then it's go for that. Um, it's really dependent on what is appropriate um, in your market. And, and I would have to do a, a local market analysis to see what is is um, available to see which is the most appropriate. Right. I think that's what you would do. Yeah, um, um, that might not uh, seem like an answer to uh, you know people who are asking, but I think that's what it all comes down to. You have to analyze the local situation and uh, and what Brian said about observation ponds. I think that that works in India. And uh, one more question, um, just uh, just before you leave, uh, we don't have any more time, but if you can quickly answer this with a yes or no, uh, Rohit Nagar Golj um, asks. While it is true that uh, waste energy plants are not sustainable, at least as far as incineration is concerned, do you think they provide a stepping stone solution for countries like India? Because you know there are so uh, some certain converging factors in mega cities. I mean, do you think it, it acts as a stepping stone? I mean, with a yes or no, and then I think we can. End I think it. there's a, there's places appropriate. Yeah, waste energy is appropriate for some places. Yeah, definitely. Um, whether uh, yeah. Because it does put a cost on the waste, and so as long as it's a, a free market 
cost that other technologies can compete with. It's the contract terms that really affect the sustain the, the the whether it's a stepping stone or not. How the contract managed is managed and the clauses and right the now, when you the contract you're you're talking about the length of the term and you're also talking about how powerful the corporation is or how powerful the yeah, the, the payment mechanisms, the length of time, the amount of waste that's guaranteed to go into the site, um, uh, whether they can remove, re who owns the waste and at what stage it becomes their ownership. I think that's the critical part of whether waste energy can act as a stepping stone or mm -hmm. whether it will be a, a inhibit future alternative uh, developments from establishing. Right, because great. there really are a lot of alternatives coming on the market. And if you want an innovative uh, sector, waste management sector, you can't have all your waste tied up for a 20 year contract to one incineration plant. Right, okay, with, with that, um, I think um, we should um, go on, uh, move to the next session. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Brian, uh, for joining us. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll check the other sessions out and i um, looking forward to um, having you, you know, talking to you again at some point. Definitely. Thanks, Ranjith. Thanks, Thanks for listening to my ramblings. <laughs> Take care. No oh, worries. Have a good one. Hey, Andy. Um, just give me one minute. Let me unmute you. Uh, Can you unmute yourself? Can you click on the mute button at the top? Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that works. Um, hi, Andy. Welcome um, to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. And uh, um, thanks for all your help in setting this up. Uh, and um, so, so, uh, so let me just um, uh, give an overview of what we what we're going to talk. Um, and uh, then we can, you know, start with our discussion. Um, so, um, friends, so uh, we have Andy Whiteman from the RWA group here. Um, um, we'll be talking about um, classifying uh, different waste management systems around the world in different uh, categories and how we can help uh, decision makers or investors understand what the next steps should be based on what classification a certain waste management system or certain country falls under. So, and um, in addition to that, we'll also be talking a little bit about um, career paths and in international development and waste management. Um, and uh, I think this will be really useful for many of you who are watching. Um, and again, let me um, remind you that uh, uh, we're watching the 2017, uh, this is the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, and uh, you can um, stay updated with our future activities by following us on social media or by subscribing to our monthly newsletter. Uh, we also have a LinkedIn group, and um, which is which has about um, 700 members. So it's, uh, you, you could also join that and uh, stay be part of the conversation. And um, we also have a viewing session from um, Odisha, Bhuvneshwar uh, uh, Odisha in India, and uh, we we have about uh, 300 people registered for all the uh, four days combined. So thank you very much for all your support. And if you have any questions, use the Q&A box uh, below the screen. Um, and um, you can also tweet to us um, at BeWasteWise or with the hashtag WasteDialog to ask questions. And let me also remind you that um, in addition to the Global Dialogue on Waste, we also publish a Waste Pioneers list, um, uh, which is uh, a list of uh, 30 organizations and 30 individuals who use social media very well to share their stories, share solutions, um, and um, and engage people with the you know concept of waste management and circular economy. And um, finally, um, we also have um, so I'm, I'm actively seeking employment. And while I was doing that, I uh, realized that um, there is no single place for um, someone in this sector to get access to good jobs or know about good jobs. So um, we request you, if you have any job opportunities with you, send it to us. We'll put them on the, uh, we'll put them uh, on our newsletter and send it to our subscribers. And we'll also put them on our, so uh, on our social media channels and then um, give access to 
uh, more people to your job opportunities so that you can also find good talent, but um, everyone else will also find a good place to you know, get access to good jobs in the, in the sector. Um, so with this, um, let me you know, welcome Andy Whiteman. Um, Andy, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Thanks very much, Ran Ranjith. Um, how are you doing? Where are you? Uh, <laughs> and what have you been doing recently, Andy? Oh, I'm sitting in the, the beautiful place of Cyprus at the moment. Um, I'm based here working uh, on a project that Brian was mentioning earlier on. We're helping to uh, guide uh, the northern part of Cyprus more towards the European standards of waste management uh, uh, recycling resource recovery and uh, it's a nice place to work. I'm taking a little break from a very heavy ske uh, travel schedule over the last uh, 27 years. <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, how did you get into waste management and uh, was this your uh, first um, entry, um, like did you enter waste management as the first job in your career or how did it happen and what, what, what drives you? Um, to stay in the sector? Yeah, I, I stumbled across it. I mean, I, I wanted a job in which I could travel, basically. So, I, I, you know, for, for me, the priority was to go around and see the world and hopefully do, do something useful. Um, I ended up uh, in Hong Kong with not very much money after a good travel around uh, Thailand and China in my early 20s and after university. And uh, I... Um, found myself working for an environmental consultancy company um, and looking at uh, not only well, including waste management uh, um, work. What happened over the next five years is that uh, uh, as time built up, I found myself getting very interested in, in, in waste management as a subject. And by about 1995, I decided to specialize in, in the subject and uh, got an opportunity to work with uh, Professor David Wilson uh, in a consultancy capacity at that time who has uh, been my was my mentor during uh, my my career and uh, and then then the the crazy traveling started uh, in earnest I, I spent about six months in India nine months actually uh, down in in Chennai area Turkey and started started roam, roaming around basically uh, in the in the uh, in the mid 1990s and then over time uh, moved on from there. Andy, um, Chennai still has waste management problems. So what did you do then? <laughs> we tried to reserve land so that uh, so that <laughs> massive development, urban development of the of the city wouldn't wouldn't mean that you had to transfer waste about you know 100 kilometers out uh, i don't know actually whether that's caused any uh, any effect after all this time but uh, i i i would would like to go back there actually i must say but uh, um, one right. of the issues which we deal with of course is that in the consultancy work we're often you know we're working we're always working on a project by project basis and it's difficult to 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 gain, uh, you know, to find out what it is that's happened as a result of your work half the time because you're busy on to another thing, which uh, uh, makes it uh, tough in some ways to feel the immediate reward. But nevertheless, I, I hope we get better at that over time as an industry. Right. And um, so finally, um, you're tired of traveling um, and you're taking a break. Is that it? Or um, will you start doing this all over? Yeah, I mean everything uh, to me. Uh, what the work we do, the careers we have, and, uh, and the points in time is dependent on, fam on our family situation. I have I have young girls that uh, in, in the heart of their schooling years, and and, uh, and I, over the last years, I found myself travelling, you know, up to around fifty percent of my time, and often you know bouncing from plane to plane uh, in different countries in quite a highly well, it, the stress builds up in a way. Um, it's quite difficult to notice that as it as it comes along. But it's always when you're doing multiple projects, you're always having to perform in, in as soon as you land on the ground in a, in, in a new environment, and uh, and over time that that does get tiring as you get a little bit older. Right. Um, so yeah, taking stock and looking forward to the next chapter. 
Right. Um, so uh, do you want to first um, start talking about um, career paths um, in, you know, international development and waste management, and then maybe we could um, get into classification of cities and, you know, how that how we can help decision makers or investors. Um, is that is that okay with you? Yeah. 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 yeah that's All right. So, um, um, so, so as um, someone, um, I am in the sector, you know, in the waste management sector, I've done quite a bit of work um, around the world. But uh, when I'm looking for full time opportunity, so how how should I, um, someone like me, think about it? Like um, look for full time opportunities, or you know, focus more on the initial consulting, or even if I do both or one of them, um, you know, what kind of countries? How do I um, zero in on the countries or the the areas that I want to work in? Um, do you have any comments or suggestions on that? Well, first of all, I'd love you to keep doing what you're doing, Ranjif, you know, and uh, for people to step up and pay you enough to keep you doing what you're doing because you're doing a great service to the industry. Um, but the, uh, the international development financing industry, which is, you know, how I get paid and I've always got paid, uh, either loan or grant finance to uh, international development uh, related work projects, essentially, which are tendered by a whole, the whole range of different uh, IFIs. Um, there is a, you know, there's, 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 there's a difficulty in breaking in issue. And, and, you know, if you don't have the required qualifications for the position, you can't get a position on the job. Uh, and getting those qualifications, getting that field exposure or even country experience is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a critical hurdle to overcome. Um, we have to in our our company because we you know we, we like to try our best to bring young people on and, and, and through into uh, in, into marketable positions in the in the uh, in the field teams and in back office or field teams depending on particular uh, uh, skills and interests and family situations but uh, um, no, we we we, ha we have to try to piggyback people onto jobs and, and find opportunities for for young people to get stuck in and contribute. Right. Um, okay. And um, so, friends, uh, for those who, who are listening, um, Andy and I decided to talk about this topic because um, we found that um, it was difficult for many people to break into the sector. And um, uh, and um, uh, and uh, have a long career. So, which is why Andy will also be um, interviewing uh, Michael Coving um, after the session, and there they'll be talking about um, uh, Michael Coving's career. You know, um, uh, what kind of personal sacrifices he has to uh, make to be uh, in this place. So, um, that will be the first time uh, we'll be talking about something like this. But um, I think from a practitioner's point of view, I think this is really important for others to know that they are not the only people um, who are going through this, but for also, for also them to understand how they could um, improve uh, what they're doing and how, how to do better. So um, I think, Andy, uh, with this, I think we can move on to the talking about classification and how investors or decision makers uh, you know, uh, make better decisions based on you know, where they're operating. Um, so, um, I can share uh, a screen, um, my screen about, um, um, I can share the classification one. Give me just one minute. Do you see it? Yep, I can see. I can see that uh, it's cut off at the bottom a little bit on my screen, but uh, I don't know about, it, about everybody else. But um, so, do you want me to just talk uh, through this? Uh, try and try and roam through this for everybody's benefit, Ranjit. Yeah, I think that that'd be really um, useful. Just um, talk a little bit about you know how you got to um, you know putting this together and uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I I I found my I think I've worked in more than 50 countries nowadays and in each country in you know many countries in different parts of the of, of the country and 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 part of the uh uh part of the uh well things have dawned on me over over time that when i go into certain situations i can I, i've theorized and I've, I, I've i've been working i'm working on a on a, on a paper and starting to 
uh, share my thoughts on this subject. So it's, it's pretty much early doors to everybody, and I and I invite uh, question and comment with wholeheartedness because uh, this is not a uh, scientific theory. But uh, nevertheless, I I, I see uh, nine uh, different bands or development stages, which I call development bands of waste management uh, in, uh, in, in my work in, in the countries I, 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 I know and have, have worked in. And uh, essentially uh, um, this, this uh, way of thinking is, 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 is helps me to understand where I'm at, what situation, the, the, what uh, where the country or location or city are, are, are at in terms of their development process and therefore what should be the uh, the most useful and uh, um, perhaps the most logical next step that we should be concentrating on in order to help to really move things forward in a shortest possible period of time to a next level and what uh, what is the critical part what is it that what's the pressure point that needs to be worked on in order to move from a certain level of uh, of development uh, of, of waste management services and systems to enter the next one it's also uh, um have i, have I used uh, it's also intended uh, um to i use this also in presentations to try to encourage people to think about incremental development rather than necessarily thinking they can jump four steps ahead uh, in one go um, to try and essentially if you if you can actually read some of these uh, blogs on that diagram uh, I, 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 a lot of the work we do as a company is in the, uh, the what I call a band one to uh, uh, three countries mm -hmm. so these are countries that where waste management is just uh, services are, ju are just being established and uh, and that there isn't yet a universal collection coverage, or if, yeah. if they've got to a high level of collection service coverage or, or a reasonable level, then there's a very generally a low level of sanitary landfill coverage. There's a, 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 often, but not always, a high level of informal sector recycling, uh, which is fragile to a certain extent because uh, sometimes the uh, often uh, people are thinking about jumping ahead to the next step and that involves a lot of mechanical treatment or or, uh, or thermal treatment which can clearly disrupt the existing informal re recycling systems now if you can see those blobs i mean we we essentially we we do a lot of work but not not entirely on trying to bring people up to a stable level of band four, which I call the prudent evolvers. Mm -hmm. I try to give the, I've given these things fancy labels to try and make it more interesting. But uh, I mean, essentially, what uh, the difference between the lower band, well, certainly the band three, which I call the universal or I mean, universal collectors, uh, where the collection services have become uh, ubiquitous almost, at least in the urban areas. And you're starting to have a uh, 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 starting to focus on sanitary landfill. Well, there we need regulation. We need a waste management law which focuses on underpinning um, uh, post-collection standards of disposal. That Brian was to you know the type of post-collection um, management systems that Brian was referring to in his in his discussion. Right. Similarly, uh, uh, um, and stop me, please, Ranji, if I'm going on a bit. Um, I you, there was a question about you know where's where's India at, and uh, um, and I've worked a bit in India, yeah, and I've also worked a bit in China, um, and I define those uh, situations, waste management situations, as band five, the the mass treaters, mm -hmm. because the population, uh, popular massive population, uh, and uh, and the and the, and the the, the resulting needs and, and the, of course it's not I'm not talking about the whole country but certain very mega city situations where you where where mass treatment systems not necessarily thermal treatment but you know large uh, integrated waste management facilities of some kind can can be done if done properly and if done if done well uh, uh, and, and cleanly um, 
can be done for a lot less money per tonne than, than similar systems in countries where the population distribution is much more you know, sparse. It's, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Right. Um, China, um, sorry, Ranji, if you go ahead. So, um, I'll stop sharing this so that um, you know, we could probably discuss about each one of these bands. And um, uh, we will share uh, these pictures on the website once um, you know, all of this is done. Um, OK. Do you want me to carry on? <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so, so each situation, and, and, and then it bounce onto band six. I mean, this is where, uh, this is your type of situation where a lot of money is flowing into the, uh, into the waste management system. Uh, the classic example would be the Eastern European waste management systems that are, are going through the uh, uh, approximation and entry into the European Union, uh, where a lot of grant money is available for investing in bringing the systems up to full uh, full spec standards, um, and these are major major feeding points for the for the waste management consultancy industry, uh, consultancy infrastructure services supplies, uh, construction. You know this is where the industry is taking off with big time money flowing in. Of course, the same big time money is is happening on in, in band five, but per capita, not so much. Um, and then we move into the, uh, so essentially the, the band six countries are those which are, are being really dragged into the, to the uh, like OECD type standards of, of universal sanitary landfill coverage, starting to invest in, in uh, mechanical biological treatment on a, you know, on a country level. Uh, not necessarily on a cherry-picked individual uh, facility level. Um, and then we have I st I, uh, the last three, or the, 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 the top, so-called top three bands, seven to eight, nine, are the differential type of systems that I see between the, uh, within the OECD countries. So, for example, a band seven environment would be you know, many of the states in, in, in uh, uh, America. Uh, other countries where there's not a great deal of like uh, national, federal, state level push, policy push. They're, they, 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 they're more market believers, they're more, okay, the landfill standards by that time are very high and the costs of landfill are reflected in the gate fee often. So the recycling systems have, uh, uh, function, but there's no, they're not target driven to the extent that band eight, which is like the UK and southern parts of Europe which are major investors and major challenged countries to uh, to bring their uh, waste management systems up to compliance with in this case European uh, directives uh, for compliance which involve massive investment in treatment systems uh, in order to bring the landfill diversion uh, targets down and then under the top band here band nine I see is that the technology innovators the technology leaders uh, countries like Germany, like, uh, uh, like the Scandinavian countries, like uh, Japan also, and, and and others to a, to a, to a certain extent, who are who really are driving the, the the new technologies and applications have traditionally done that. And then, of course, I stick in uh, thanks to a friend of mine, Adam uh, Adam Reed, the uh, band zero. You know, let's not forget that actually we're you know we're trying to get where we where this whole thing started, which is uh, 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 dealing with. Uh, with the production and consumption issues and band zero are called the zero wasters and I, I don't know whether that's a starting point or an ending point uh, on, on this uh, on this theoretical uh, uh, development curve but so what I try to do essentially is to, to compartmentalize different situations in order to help me understand what uh, what interventions are most useful at different stages Right. Um, since you mentioned Adam, um, Adam Reed um, just says hi to you on Twitter. All right. Um, mate. <laughs> um, so, um, all right. So, uh, do you also want to talk a little bit about um, um, how? So, based on this classification, so how can someone um, who's looking at a country understand which band it is in, or in under which classification it is, in, so that you know they can. Yeah, I, I mean, first thing is to, first thing is that you know, the 
different places in the country will will exhibit different bands it's not like you know everything everything is certainly not universal it's, you know certain cities in for example uh, egypt cairo would be uh, pretty close to a band three it would be a sort of a um, uh, um, you know universal collector but with very very little uh, 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 sanitary landfill coverage, whereas other parts of Egypt would be band one and band two. There are places without any collection services. There are places with you know. So first of all, is that is uh, I use a, um, um, a sort of a, 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 I've got a little graph thing which shows certain with with collection coverage, uh, sanitary landfill coverage, recycling uh, performance and treatment intensity, and that sort of helps guide me into uh, into this direction, into which which type of place I'm working in uh, and uh, and also one of the things which um, I, I try to uh, uh, I don't know whether you can flip up the uh, cost per ton um, diagram Ranji because you know as we move th through these levels of development the cost per ton of waste increase and uh, and, and you know uh, I, I sort of uh, face uh, in my daily work Every project, you know, there's always, uh, there's Easy. always, uh, yeah. Thank you, mate. There's always, uh, uh, there's always an offer on the table for, uh, for one type of facility or, or another, and uh, um, essentially, uh, you know, but people have to recognise that, you know, you, whatever, it, whatever system you are going for, you know, you have to pay for it at the end of the day or the beginning of the day. You mean you can send the waste to the moon if you want, but as long, you know. Technologically is not the barrier. The technological issues are not necessarily the barrier. What what is so critical, as Brian touched on earlier on, is do you have the operating revenue to, to manage the systems? So, you know that you see the massive jump of cost per ton from the band D to band C. Now that's that's that is a function of the the salaries as well, the salary levels in the countries in in, in particular. But you know. Moving from a situation where you're paying around, say, for example, you're a band G, you're in the order of 10 to 20 euros a ton for uh, combined services, uh, maybe very little proportion of that, mostly going to collection, where you get, you know, just moving up to 15 to 25, where you've got a sort of like a, a controlled disposal uh, coming in. Um, is, is actually quite a big jump at that level. You know, we're talking per ton system-wise. That's a lot of money. And as you go in, through this system, as you go, you realise that there's more money being circulated in the economy. And certainly, more jobs, more business opportunities, and the massive uh, trouble that Band D countries have, moving from this this sort of like fifty euro a ton. To about you know in, in the hundreds, uh, around hundreds, is is like um, is, is is obviously a huge jump. The big difference between those countries in, is is the uh, whether due process is adhered to in in the contracting uh, and tendering and contracting process for services. A lot of times the the we, you know doing waste management you can't avoid. Uh, I believe using the C word corruption word and when the, the you know when we see the amounts of money that are in the economy at that stage we have to be very mindful of the fact that that there are unscrupulous operators uh, that are working to win contracts where which to the detriment essentially of the system um, not just the contractors but the people that are tend tendering them and uh, not universally but uh, the, the the temptation is certainly there the the, the waste management services economy is a serious part of the economy at that stage. That's not to say that uh, corruption, etc., doesn't influence development from right from the beginning. But this, that, uh, and it certainly does, the, uh, but uh, um, at that stage of development, it was very serious. Um, and procurement laws and, and tendering and due process is, is uh, becomes what I see as the fundamental uh, difference between uh, on a systemic wide level of development. Right, and um, we, we were also um, talking about um, how uh, we could help um, investors understand, you know, where they could play and what kind of role they could play um, in all of this by understanding. So uh, could you talk a little bit about that? 
you know, um, um, I know you have a band in there which says it's, uh, um, you know, it's uh, investor feeders. So they, uh, those systems are, um, they work based on a lot of investor money. Um, you know, what's what's a classification? What does that system look like? And, you know, uh, what can investors do in such systems? Also, what can they do if investors are interested in other systems um, elsewhere? You know, what kind of opportunities do they have? Okay. Um, I've actually got, and I'm, I hope to put it together with someone's going to have to help me, uh, Ranjith, um, uh, um, investment costs, you know, a unit costs investment at different, at the, within these bands, uh, rules, rules of thumb uh, type investment levels. I haven't got them on the top of my mind uh, at the moment, but, uh, but what, you know, what, where, as you see, as you go through, I mean, I'd, I'd like to flip your question, if I may, to where, you know, to a more personal thing as a practitioner. Sure. You know, where, where's, where, where, where are your skills best placed? If you're more into technology, if you're more into, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you're more into, well, it depends on your, also the types of places you want to live as well and or the, what's going on in your country or, or um, the best place to do development is at home. Um, so, you know, it, it depends what's going on, but the type of, uh, the type of skill sets that I see practitioners need at different levels of different bands are also different. You need a lot more technical people in, uh, in, in the band six and above, um, where you have these major planning, major feasibility studies, cost benefit analysis, financial economic analysis, uh, tender, you know, contra contract documents, uh, FIDIC, Requirements, construction, supervision—you know the proper serious engineering disciplines. Uh, you know are, are, are well served in a, in band six countries. Um, there's a lot of work for for engineers in band six. Whereas, you know, if you've got if you're more of a sort of like social but policy background, or even you know, you know, if you if you if you're not so strong on the sort of the deep tech aspects, then you can find yourself working very happily in, in some of the uh, lower band countries where, you know, you're dealing with common sense issues rather than deep tech. You don't need to know what, you know, what the diameter of the, of, of, of the, of the pipe coming out of the uh, one thing or another is in order to function and be useful and to promote development in, 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 in those band countries. So if you're more of a, a, a sort of a social type of uh, you know, uh, more more social uh, s science type of background. Not to say with the, the band early bands don't need engineers; they certainly do, and there's some legendary ones as well working in the industry. But uh, nevertheless, it's more of a uh, to me, it's a, it's a communication uh, skill skill still say with a solid enough technical backing. And so, I mean, clearly, when you get into the high high band issues, and and the, the the market is so differentiated that you know, you you know, you don't just talk about having lead chain treatment experts. You know, no one, you know, there there are there's a whole different subcategory of different lead chain treatment experts which you need to hire the precise one. You know, or or or, or you know, depending on each uh, uh, types of. Uh, uh, treatment technology, or and indeed nowadays, uh, uh, it's flipped almost in the top bands for being again. It's a social policy issue related to circular economy. So again, we come back to the type of skill sets which are quite useful in the early bands. Uh, I find myself working equally comfortable in Australia as I do in uh, Egypt, right? Because I'm more of a social policy person rather than an engineer so but uh, uh, nevertheless so that you know it depends what you're into where you are what your uh, situation is that there's a there's a lot to be done a huge amount of work to be done there's a huge amount of investment too that, that, that is required and that doesn't require just technical expertise it requires it certainly massively but it also requires people to go and make that change happen Right, and um, I'm also um, thinking, so um, if there are um, global companies or global investors or global change agents, uh, I come across them quite a bit um, in, uh, in New York and Washington, D.C. 
who are looking at different countries around the world and you know they want to make interventions and um and um you know deploy capital or catalyze capital in different areas of, of the world so um I, I think i was that was my previous question so if that's the case um you know what kind of places are they looking at and um and while you think about that, maybe um, you can answer this um, really quick question um, from Paola. She asks, um, she shared a link about um, plastic fibers being found in all waters around the world. And um, she asks whether um, uh, there's anything we could do about it uh, to revert this, or is it too late? Because um, uh, microplastics and plastics are an issue worldwide. Um, and they're found everywhere, even in some of the deepest oceans. So um, maybe you could um, respond to this and then quickly talk about, you know, um, change agents and people wanting to do interventions. On the yep. Area. Okay. I'll, I'll give it a go. I mean, uh, it's a, quite a flip of subjects, but I'll give it a go. In, in terms yeah. of marine pollution and, uh, um, and, and marine litter, that's receiving now global level attention. I mean, it's. It, it, it used to be uh, in our industry, we used to leverage projects based on starting from health to governance to, uh, to uh, urban development to uh, climate change. And there, you know, what we find in our industry is that, you know, it's basically connected to everything. Now, clearly, marine litter, plastics, micro uh, particles um, uh, is related to land-based sources of emissions. Now, I, I could say, you know, we could all spend our whole lives trying to, you know, to, uh, we need a lot of people working on this. Um, is it is it reversible? I think that I think we need to get very serious about extended producer responsibility um, uh, legislation worldwide. Um, I think it's it's uh, uh, in terms of the. the Packaging industry taking responsibility for the for the for the materials that you know surround the products we buy from them is to me is a is is, is a no brainer. That's how certain systems should be paid for from the point of sale of consumption of products. Now, if we get uh, uh, responsibility chains in from uh, uh, from the essentially from the industry that's uh, that's the fast moving consumer goods industry taking responsibility for a uh, uh, deposit refund or other systems of managing the, the materials which are being delivered into the environment as a result of their their products of which we very happily buy from them um, then we could start to see a big difference i think um, cleaning up afterwards is uh, is also something we're going to have to do uh, i Personally, uh, you know, we have here of uh, have organised a beach cleanup. So, in in uh, 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 over this period of time, we're living on a tourist island here. But you know, you can clean a beach, and the next day it's going to be dirty. You know. Then again, it's better to do that than to do nothing. So, uh, uh, I'm, I'm I think we need to seriously look at extended producer responsibility as our industry con contribution to this global problem. Right, and um, th this was a topic that we discussed yesterday as part of the going beyond a circular economy and um, putting a price on pollution and um, excellent producer respons responsibility did come up quite a bit and uh, I believe that's, uh, um, you know, really... Um, um, so um, uh, that's Michael Coving joining. So um, okay, all right. So I was just saying that um, excellent producer responsibility is definitely uh, one of the major contributions that um, our sector can do to the society. Um, uh, and um, one more. Uh, so can you talk about the investors? And then we have another question. Since you said um, you work on uh, more on the uh, on the social side, um, there is a question from our um, viewing partner. Uh, he's organizing a, a se session of his friends and uh, colleagues to watch this live. Narsinga uh, Panigrahi. He's asking, how can we as citizens and the common people influence municipalities and governments to upgrade waste management processes in the city? That's one question. But before that, could you talk about you know uh, the change agents? You know where should they look at and what should they consider? Crikey, we're having some 
good questions here. Um, I'll try and uh, my mind is bouncing around lots of different things, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. In terms of uh, investor points of uh, hotspots, I mean, I'm very interested in in uh, in the Black Soldier Fly uh, technology coming forward. I, I believe that offers quite a lot uh, for us to think about a lot of. Uh, and and apply and that could bring people from band three universal collectors up to uh, you know band five six quite quickly um, or at least a, there's a little bit of a hop potential from there uh, uh, let's try let's back that let's 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 try and get something sorted because we as an industry we're too slow people are impatient to move forward very quickly and and whilst we are are, are try to be prudent evolvers, we also need to have something to offer as an industry to, to those uh, politicians that are looking at people and systems that need something a little bit more quick uh, than, than that. So uh, but as points of investment, certainly band three, um, band four is, is, is important. Every, each band has the different investment characteristics essentially it really kicks off as i said in band six and then uh, also in band eight major investment going on um and so uh, um, now what was the next one because i don't i know i haven't got um, the, next one. Hmm? the next one was um uh, from narsinga panigrahi he asks uh, how can we as citizens and the common people influence municipalities and governments to upgrade waste management processes in the city. And before you answer that, um, this just reminds me, this session just reminds me, in India, there used to be a tradition. Uh, it's called um, Ashtavadhanam. And what that actually does is you have a scholar or a, um, uh, yeah, you have a scholar or a guru sitting um, at the center and you have eight other scholars around him. And then they ask questions from any topic and any research. And then, um, so, and the scholar has to respond to it. And once do that, then he becomes an Ashtavadana, like his title as a, as a, this just reminds me of that, given the, you know, the uh, breadth of uh, topics that are going on. But um, can you quickly respond to this? How can citizens uh, do, what can citizens do um, in influencing? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I see, I, you're probably asking the wrong person because I'm always working inside the system. I'm not, and I'm not trying to, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I think about this subject like as a bit, a bit geeky. You know, I'm. I'm, I'm so much into the detail that I'm sort of like. But uh, as a citizen, well, I mean, expecting your politicians to deliver what what it is they're actually uh, has been promised. Never miss a good crisis um, or a bad crisis. These these things really do uh, uh, shape uh, uh, things. Unfortunately, sometimes it, it, it you know it transfers people too quickly in the wrong direction. But there are there are there are there are there are moments in time where, given where given your contacts and your friends and your networks, and the more and more you get into this industry, you'll have more of them. The change agent role you you can use in your own best way. We all try our best uh, in that department. I wish I I wish I had had more impact and I'll certainly always try and refine my skills. At the end of the day, as a, working as a foreigner in other people's countries, I always try to leave it, uh, uh, I always try, try to help behind the scenes rather than, you know. I, one of the sayings I, I, I have uh, recently, one of my favorite ones is, the politicians never know what to take credit for until we tell them. <laughs> Great. I think that's a good um, closing um, remark um, for us. So um, we have uh, Michael Coving join us. So um, so um, in this next session, um, Andy and Michael will talk about um, being a practitioner, being on the front line, and what it takes personally to be there. And um, I hope they also get to talk a little bit about systems and waste management. That's a personal um, request for me. Um, so that you know, all of us who are, who are sitting here and watching could um, you know learn more from their um, incredible experience. So um, with that, let me um, introduce Michael. Um, give me just one minute to do so. Um, hi, Mike, can you um, unmute yourself? Um, I can mute you, but I can't unmute you. How's that? Yeah, that's good. So um, thanks, Mike, for um, joining us. And um, Andy, um, you can you can take it from here. Much appreciated. Oh, thanks. 
Hi, Mike. Andy, how are you? Good, mate. Good. Excellent. So, uh, um, so uh, for those that don't uh, don't know Mike, uh, uh, he's uh, often described as the James Bond of the, uh, of the waste management <laughs> in developing countries industry. Thank you, uh, Andy. Yeah, I thought I'd get that one in first, and uh, so you can. Uh, We'll take it from there. But uh, essentially, you know, you, you've been you've been working on the front line for for uh, as long as I can remember, um, and uh, and just so uh, uh, to give a tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, when did you get stuck into this industry, Mike? And uh, you know, what's the range of places you find yourself working? Yeah. Well, thanks, Andy. I've been listening uh, with interest to both you and Brian. So. Uh, very enlightening, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, in terms of, well, the starting point, where, why did I get involved in waste management? I think mine's perhaps quite simple in terms of, um, I'd say, being impacted by the environment in which I grew up. So having spent the formative years of my life in Essex, east of London, um, which receives, I think, a very large proportion of waste generated um, in the city of London itself or the conurbation of London. So from a young age I was exposed to a lot of the things we associate with the waste management se uh, sector. The trucks, uh, the dust, the litter flying down the road, um, the landfill site wasn't too far from my backyard so all of the environmental impacts from the landfill site and I think I was struck from quite an early age of the, uh, the negative impacts of waste management as it were and struck also by a sense that uh, I wanted to be involved in very simplistically trying to make the environment better and trying to clean up. So from my um, early formative years, that followed on at university a bit, perhaps like yourself and Brian doing um, various environmental courses and degrees. But whether I was doing um, my first degree in, in geography or my master's degree in environmental science, or then indeed going on to doing a diploma in waste management. My particular interest was I did a lot of research in terms of impacts from landfill sites, impacts on public health, water, environment, air. And I was very interested early on in terms of how we could address these impacts, but in a, a cost sensitive fashion, not by throwing large sums of money at a problem, but how could things be done in perhaps a more robust and pragmatic way which naturally led me on to, to most of my working life which has been in the developing world so a, a rather meandering response to your succinct question there Andy so where do you find yourself going nowadays well, um, where are you? well if we talk about okay like like yourself I think I've worked in more than 50 odd countries Last week I was in Uganda working in the oil sector, uh, training government environmental inspectors how to monitor and how to regulate the oil sector, but very much from an environmental and a waste management point of view. Um, the oil sector, which is omnipresent, produces vast quantities of waste, much of which is, is hazardous. So that was last week. Um, this week, later this week, I'm off to Nigeria. Again, the oil sector is kind of the end of the chain, um, managing cleanup of oil spills in the Niger Delta. Um, so I am a waste management practitioner, but it's a very broad church. So in terms of the oil sector waste management, what the oil spills end up with, they end up as a massive waste management problem. So there's a theme running through all of it. Um, I'm also engaged in, in Egypt at the moment with hazardous waste. I'm in, engaged in the Gaza Strip on municipal waste management. So again, very broad church and wherever you find yourself in the world, whether it's the developed world, developing world, as you say, Australia or Africa, the waste management problems are never far away. So wherever in the world you find yourself, you can immerse yourself in these waste management challenges. So, I mean, what has it attracted you to, uh, you know, which the frontline problems? I mean, you are out there. I mean, uh, this involves a lot of time away from home. Others, which I know, and I'm to let everyone else know, involves, involves a lot of personal sacrifice. Uh, it involves basically, you know, what drives you? Where, where, where's, where's, you know, where's this coming from? How, how do you manage to sustain all this? Mm -hmm. the what energy? drives me to, to spend lots of time away from home? Um, <laughs> have you met my wife? 
Only to, um, <laughs> I think Brian was saying earlier, it, um, when you're in the field, be it a developing country, as I've been now for over 30 years, um, I think at the risk of sounding cliched, you can really act as a catalyst for change. The problems in the developing world are probably far larger than we experience in Europe or North America. The systems are far more immature. Um, levels of governance are challenging in terms of good governance, transparency, accountability. So I think simplistically, one can have a very tangible, clear impact in these sorts of environments. And again, if I think if one is sincere about wanting to be a catalyst of change, to affect change, there's no substitute for being there in the field, in the thick of it. And as you were talking earlier about the need to be perhaps multidisciplinary in your skills, in the field, in the developing world, you've got to be something of a diplomat, a politician, a social scientist, an environmental scientist. So what drives me, I think, is, is this desire for change, seeing change and affecting change by being in the thick of it, as it were. It's one thing sitting in London, um, strategizing and hypothesizing, writing policies and procedures. That's part of the equation. But it's actually, as the Americans would say, what would they say? Where the rubber meets the tarmac or meets the road, where you've actually got to implement change, you've got to deal with all of the technical, social, political problems. You've got to address the omnipresent problem that you mentioned of bad governance and corruption. So it's both challenging but extremely rewarding and stimulating being in the field. Like you, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm, sp I'm still spending about 50% of my time in the field. And uh, over the next year or two, that, that equation, that balance would need to, ch to change a little bit so I can put my slippers on and smoke my pipe at home a little bit more. So, okay, well, there's a couple of angles we can move on from here. You know, uh, I'll start with the, the, with, the, with, the, with the nice friendly one. And, uh, and that is, okay, well, okay, people like you and me, we, you know, we, or as you say, you're getting on and I'm not quite, nearly, nearly catching up with you. Yes. But, uh, um, you know, what about the young people when it, uh, coming into this industry? Do you see a lot of that? Is there, you know, is there much upward mobility of young professionals in our industry? And, and you know what is it that you're doing to to help that? Uh, you know I'm not talking just about like foreigners doing consulting. I'm talking about the environmental inspectors you're training up in the country. You know what, what's the age profile here? Well, if we environmental inspectors, waste management inspectors. If I, if I talk about Uganda, where I was last week. Um, Massive problems in terms, and, and it applies across the spectrum, massive problems in terms of lack of resources, lack of equipment, human resources, financial resources. So being tasked with, in this instance, monitoring from an environmental point of view, the oil sector, but it's not a level playing field. They don't have the resources to do the job. The big industries, the oil industries, have all the resources and all the power. So it, it's, it's a very unfair fight, as it were. How we can start to address that in Uganda, I'm dealing with a cadre of very young, enthusiastic professionals. Um, the donor in this instance is the um, government of Norway with their oil revenue for development. And it's, it's training on the ground, it's practical experience, but it's also, where possible, giving individuals in developing countries perhaps the opportunity to, to go and look at what is happening in the developed world. So in Uganda, many practitioners are having the opportunity to go to Norway to see how the sector is being managed and being run. And I think that's part of it. But as you mentioned earlier, there's a danger that an individual could go to the developed world. And if we're talking about waste management, come back with, with the perception that everything modern is good and in the pursuit of modernity to buy the newest vehicles, containers, landfill technology, incineration. So one has to balance that because what works in Norway isn't necessarily applicable or appropriate in a sub-Saharan Africa or indeed Indian context. So I am seeing a lot of youngsters in the developing world coming through. I'm seeing that there are many barriers to their progression. There are barriers to them executing their jobs um, to the desirable degree. But uh, again, in the field with the practitioners, people like ourselves can perhaps help to um, 
break some of those ceilings, make people more upwardly uh, mobile and have access to the tools that they need. In the context of the UK and developing countries, I mean, are, are we seeing youngsters coming through? Well, we've just heard from a, a very uh, capable youngster there in Brian. Brian's a young man um, with a wealth of knowledge. So I am seeing youngsters coming through into the sector. That's not to say it's easy though, because there are many challenges if you're talking about working in the development sector, if you're talking about working for the large multinational consultancy companies that you and I have worked for, the ERMs, the Mott McDonald's, the WS Atkins, the dilemma for a young individual is having the experience to make them viable to send overseas on a project to actually contribute. And you know, where do you get that experience if you haven't got the experience? So it's the chicken and egg syndrome. I, as a, a practitioner and a mentor in organizations such as the consultancy, as I spent many years in the United Nations Environment Program, I took it personally that it was my responsibility to train youngsters and to give them options and opportunities. So I would take, for example, I worked for three years in Nigeria, southern Nigeria. I took over those three years many young members of staff from the UN with me. Um, I would mentor them, I would give them tasks, work programs, and I would work with them in the field. Um, and that was very beneficial in terms of they've been exposed to the environment, the challenges, they come back, their confidence is enhanced, their experience is enhanced. And I think old, old individuals like ourselves, Andy, and other people listening have a responsibility to give these youngsters a leg up and open that door into the market. So that's an ongoing process. And so, I mean, the, the, um, in terms of the role of capacity building, the role of these sort of grant-based technical assistance type projects, not necessarily related or tied to infrastructure uh, grants or loans. I mean, uh, uh, Given that the structural financing problems in, in many countries, but certainly certainly not not all, uh, in terms of allocating budgets for uh, for professional development into the sector, for you know for staffing up uh, inspectorates, uh, environmental agencies, or uh, or ministries, or indeed uh, waste management departments in municipalities and cities, um, you know, given there is a structural problem in, in there. Um, have you found, you know, how have you found the, uh, the, 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 the response of the international development financing uh, industry? Is it long enough on the ground or is it too much, uh, uh, you know, is there longevity in there? Does that give people a chance? And, it, and also, is it, 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 does, that, does that warp the, uh, the whole salary scales and the expectations as well? What's the, how's the dynamic of that in your experience? Yeah, I think there was about six or seven questions in that one question. Uh, so I'll try and pick. I'm my talking way about through. Southern Sudan. I'll pick my way through that uh, political minefield there. But um, yeah, it, we we could debate at nauseum. Does the development model work? And I think there's a lot of uh, evidence to suggest in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it's not working. Um, a case in point: I've just completed some work in Egypt for. Uh, the Euro European Bank of Development and, and Reconstruction, I think it is, if I've got the acronym right. But anyway, European Bank of Development. Um, looking to put money into landfills uh, to assist with waste management. So a program of landfill development on a regional basis. Um, I, I conducted some workshops, some site inspections, where on like almost a 10-year cycle, other international donors have put money into infrastructure, landfill sites. Um, and they're, they're monoliths of failed development. They sit there, I heard Brian speaking earlier, um, in everything but name, they're dump sites. They might have the gate, they might have the waybridge, the compactors, the liners. After 10 years or so, very often after two or three years, they don't work anymore. The, la the landfill liner has been burnt through, through the race being burnt. The compactors sitting there because there's no money for spare parts or training. The way bridges don't work. So simply creating a piece of kit is certainly, from my experience, isn't, isn't the solution. And in giving a municipality or a regional government a landfill site, you, you actually haven't helped them very much because you've then saddled them with increased operational costs, um, leachate treatment, as we were hearing, costs money. Running electric pumps in the lagoons costs money. 
maintaining, repairing the equipment costs money. So very often I see local governments encumbered with pieces of kit. They didn't have the budget to operate beforehand and they certainly don't have the budget afterwards. And so it does, simply doesn't work. So it concerns me when I see another development bank coming along in a cyclical fashion some years later with the same blueprint of we'll build an engineered landfill site without taking on board what are the sustainability factors, what has to be in place to make this work. And for waste management and other social developments, um, I think there are a number of factors. Now, I sit before you naked, Andy. I don't have flip charts like you had. I don't even have the playing cards that Brian had. If only he could have found them. But <laughs> let me talk that through. Um, to make waste management generally work, to make a landfill specifically work, you have to have a number of things. You've got to have cost recovery. And cost recovery invariably isn't there or is insufficient. You've got to have public education, not enough attention paid to public education. You've got to have legislation and enforcement, and you've got to build capacity. So as it were, to go back to one of your old models, I think if you think of waste management as a table, you need four strong legs to make that stable. If the only leg that table has is a landfill site, there's no instability, there's no sustainability. Again, I'm in danger of, of meandering, but um, until development recognizes the sustainability factors, simply investing in capital works can't work from my perspective, which is where other organizations, other development organizations, to some extent differed in the UK, certainly GIZ in Germany, who come at development from another dimension. They come at it from the point of view of capacity development, as you mentioned, giving um, individuals exposure to training, resources, capacity building. This is fundamental, and this has to marry investment in infrastructure. So only when we have this sort of capacity building, um, career progression, and all of the rest of it, I think, can waste management be sustainable in a developing country forum. And part of this whole equation that has to be addressed by development is, is good governance. So if there's an absence of good governance, if there's an absence of transparency in how bids are managed, how contracts are awarded, if there's an absence of transparency in terms of how the district or the municipality are handling their finances, then this is a fundamental roadblock to achieving the desired end goal of sustainability, protection of environment and protection of public health. You've moved on very gracefully to the, uh, the difficult question. Oh. You know, you're well known, Mike, uh, amongst your friends as a corruption buster. Mm -hmm. You're not shy to, uh, to, to basically uh, speak out when, when it needs to happen. That's put yourself in, a, in, a, in difficult positions, uh, personally. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, people coming into the industry, working on the front line. What's the rule book? What do you need to know that you're getting into, how to protect yourself, and how to indeed navigate yourself around very difficult frontline issues such as corruption? Good question. Good question. Um, Almost undoubtedly, if you spend any time in the developing world on the ground, you're going to be faced by issues of, of poor governance, corruption being a major contribution to that. And I found myself, because my, my, my approach, my work profile has been, I don't like to parachute in for two weeks, write a report and leave. So the, the formative part of my career, I spent... Um, many years living in developing countries, as I say, as a catalyst in the middle of it, such as Ghana and Nigeria and Brunei in Asia, then moving on happily to the Caribbean where I spent many years. If you're in the middle of it, if you are trying to link all these diverse pieces of the jigsaw together, then you're going to encounter these sorts of problems. When I was younger and perhaps a little bit was I bolder or more naive? I would make a point of shining the torch on corruption and malpractice in the government sector, which I still feel passionately that we have a role and a responsibility for doing. I still do it wherever I encounter it, but perhaps I'm a bit older, I'm a bit wiser, and there are ways of doing it in a less confrontational way 
which doesn't lead you personally to risk your safety, risk your well-being, as mine has been compromised and risked on many occasions. I'm shortly going to embark on some very difficult work in an African country. I will be monitoring millions of dollars of work, and it's been brought to my attention that the contracting process and the contractor who has the contract, the process is compromised and that the agency for whom I'm monitoring the work are actually pulling the strings behind the company that got the contract. We've all been there, we all know about it, I'm going into it with my eyes open. I won't tolerate it, but what I won't do is I won't make it an open confrontation. I will do the best I can do to dismantle the problems I encounter in a, in a fashion that could hopefully unravel things, but in so doing, not put me directly in the firing line. Difficult question, and it's a question that many practitioners are gonna to have to face. That's a, I think that's a pretty, pretty good answer to that one, Mike. Thank you very much. Almost, almost run out of questions after that time. I was listening to <laughs> But uh, I don't know whether, Ranjeev, whether you have uh, any, 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 any questions coming in from other people, please feel free to, to fire them over to the chat. I'll have a look. But uh, in, in, in the meantime, Mike, I mean, you are, um, uh, you spoke about public awareness. Raising. I see this. I see this uh, uh, as being a major under underspend. Not uh, you know, forget about the development assistance industry, but but structurally within within countries uh, uh, in the waste management system, we you know we're sort of running headlong into a, into a speeding train that's coming in the opposite direction in, in a lot of the waste management. Uh, Product projects, but you know. So, in terms of also the 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 need to galvanise support from public to bring the uh, you know societies along with you for the journey. How do you how do you go about doing that in the field? Do, you know, how much of your time would you normally spend on sort of like visibility aspects and promotion or and social and sort of the outreach to uh, um, to, to the public? Sure. So sure. again, it's, it's location specific, what pertains on the ground, what are the avenues of communication, education. As you say, usually they're very, very poor, given scant attention, if given any attention at all. So if I'm to spend time on the ground in any given location, I would probably spend, in reality, between 25 and 50% of my time done allocated to community awareness, community engagement, and it's, it's multifaceted. That can be, if we're talking um, upgrading of waste management facilities, building a landfill site, wanting to increase the waste fee, the waste tariff, how waste is delivered. The starting point, and to me, the epicenter has to be the community. We have to engage with the community. We have to understand their expectations. We have to articulate clearly what it is we're aiming to do what their roles and responsibilities are, and fundamentally, which doesn't often happen, fundamentally we need to gain the approval and the endorsement of the community, so their stakeholders. Um, how you do that, again, it's multifaceted. If I think back, for example, to work I did many years ago in Guyana, Georgetown, Guyana, a waste management uh, project where landfills were being built, Waste collection was being restructured, new waste tariffs were coming in. Hadn't given due thought to the whole societal aspect, awareness raising, consultation, and, and two-way dialogue. So um, being on the ground, I managed to recruit the services of a local company who had experience in this. And we put together um, a range of communication tools, ranging from a simple community meeting going into the community at pre-arranged times, using town criers. So you're using the structures that exist. So you often have town criers who would announce um, public notices to, to the general residents with a bell. He would ring a bell. He would announce the meeting. The meeting would be ordained. That's a starting point, community meetings. And it got more sophisticated with things like TV and radio ads, but again, it's got to be appropriate. Are you working in an environment where the community has access to TV? 
in many African communities, I find the radio is a more powerful means of communication. The family would sit around the uh, radio at supper time. If you're putting out information, adverts, talk shows, get people involved in talk shows, let them ring in and challenge the decision makers. And again, in Georgetown, Guyana, we did something quite sophisticated, but affordable and sustainable. We even made a TV soap opera based around community life, around a dump site, looking at the day-to-day -day lives of people. And some of the resident themes were people getting sick, children missing school, people being off work, and all of these things which had tangible links to bad waste management, but we put across in a way that was both entertaining but educational at the same part at the same time. Again, I'm in danger of meandering, but it's a central topic and there's no one right approach. The approach has to be tailored to the local environment in which you're working. And if I had one wish, it would be that the development sector would pay far more attention to this whole aspect of engaging with the community. So when you uh, go in, I mean, you, you've, you spend a lot of your career working in, uh, in post-disaster emergency response uh, issues, in, in post-conflict uh, uh, emergency response issues. And when you get on the ground, is this what you do? What do you do? What do you do on day one when you chip up after there's been an earthquake or, a, or there's been a, you know, an incident of some kind? Mm -hmm. Well, very often. Um, in terms of emergencies, I've responded with the United Nations to natural emergencies in uh, Myanmar, China, Japan. Um, I'd say in the case of Japan and, and probably China, now as things evolve, quite sophisticated emergency response structures, procedures and professionals. Earlier on in the day, um, many years back, one would turn up and I think it would be fair to say, despite the best of intentions, one would usually be found with a situation of, of chaos, a lack of order, a lack of coordination. In the case of China, some years ago, the Sichuan earth, earthquakes, even the international community would be in disarray. You would be typically swamped with um, donor agencies um, of various disciplines, a lack of coordination, and everyone chipping away, trying to find their niche in the market. What is it they're, they're there to do? And often a lot of duplication and replication, even with the international community. So I think the starting point is really getting to understand as quickly as possible what the terrain is, who the key players are internationally and locally. And again, to try and act in a, in a coordination fashion around people having a shared goal, objective, and agreeing methodologies and who is going to do what. So again, that's about communication, it's about dialogue, and it's about goal setting. Um, as I say, I head off to um, a very difficult environment in Nigeria later this week in um, war-torn communities which have been in conflict and at war with the government of Nigeria. It relates to the oil industry, but again, very strong linkages with environment and waste management. Hundreds of thousands of tons of waste oil, uh, oil products, a very degraded environment, fisheries impacted, water impacted, health impacted. My starting point is going to be communication with the communities. Again, why are we there? What are we trying to do? Can we enlist their support? And most importantly, what's missing in most of these environments, particularly in conflict environments, trust. We've got to engage and we've got to win the trust of the host communities and that's hard one it took me perhaps 18 months last time i was working in the niger delta but that's my blueprint and that's my starting point work with the communities be open be transparent and try and win trust and then once you've won trust you've got to keep that trust so you've got to keep doing what you were doing which is you have to keep dialoguing you have to keep sharing experience sharing data and that would very much be my starting point, and that's where I'll be starting again later this week in, in the Niger Delta. Please, everybody uh, who's, uh, who's, who's online, feel free to write some questions uh, uh, in the uh, Q&A box below, and, uh, and, and, and we'll fire through uh, those to, to Mike. Uh, this is uh, golden, golden stuff, Mike, and uh, um, I'm sure everybody is... Uh, uh, wishing you well for the for that next uh, assignment 
because that's, the next uh, challenge absolutely that's, yeah that's quite, absolutely that's obviously quite a full on one uh, uh, you know in terms of you know uh, trying to you know round back to the issue of of the upward mobility of, of, of the young people in the industry i mean from the communities do you, are, there, are, there, are there structural ways oh, i've got a question in um, as well let me bounce sorry mike let me bounce to a question because it's going to be far better than my one um uh, this is uh they've got a couple now is they're firing in prepare yourself oh there's what a third one coming if i could if i could jump in here and it's one from um our colleague yeah. brian saying have i seen his waste management playing cards sorry brian i, I can't help you with that one I, I don't know where you <laughs> uh, we, we, do they exist so what advice would you give to someone starting fresh in waste management? How do we decide between the tracks of consulting or contracting, you know, uh, in, in doing implementation ourselves? Well, that's uh, from Recycle Paper. So, okay, okay. Good question. Um, I don't think necessarily it's a question of one or the other. I think if there are opportunities there, I see contracting, I see consulting, I see regulation all is being complementary. So someone like Brian and Andy, the reason that they're of value in the field itself is because of a broad experience. And someone like myself, I, I go into the field, I've done many years as a regulator, I've done many years as an operator, I've built landfill sites, I've operated them, I've run waste collection um, companies and worked for the public sector in the city of London, I've educated, I've been a consultant, so I think it's very good to have rounded experience and if waste management is the sector you wish to pursue, I see the different facets as interlinked and complementary. So if you have an opportunity to get in on the regulatory side, absolutely go for it. The contracting side, go for it. Um, because I think you'll find two or three years further down the line, as your experience grows, opportunities will open up to you and you will then have the opportunity, as it were, to jump from one side of that dividing line, if indeed it is a dividing line, to the other. And I, at my age, I'm still hopping from one side to the other in terms of being a practitioner, being a regulator, a consultant, or a contractor. So go for whatever opportunities are there, and I think that there are very strong linkages between all of these uh, silos of opportunity, as it were. Okay, that question is uh, during Mike from Rohit. Uh, that, that question was from Narasinga, by the way. Uh, from Rohit, who's uh, asking during the tendering process for a project, uh, there's a certain plan along with a cost benefit analysis uh, backing up the project. As you near the completion, do you feel uh, you stick to the payback period? Uh, do, does the does what is forecast? I guess this means is what is forecast in the cost benefit analysis in terms of underpinning the financial rationale of the project. Does it actually materialise? How much change is acceptable for a developing country when a lot of a lot of, fav, uh, a lot of funding is available? You know, so what's the uh, the difference between what's planned and forecast in order to justify the money expenditure? In, in contrast to actually what happens on the ground and, and what level of variability is manageable? Mm. That's a very interesting and challenging question. And the whole science, as it were, of cost-benefit analysis, of environmental economics, is, is it's an emerging topic. Um, one incidentally that my daughter's studying at university right now, Andy, and she'll be coming to you with her CV very shortly in terms of how we increase mobility in the sector. But um, I think there's a danger of being too uh, dogmatic in what we set out early. I think all models, all risks have to build in a degree of flexibility. I, I know very few of any projects over my 30 odd years that have followed, followed the development blueprint, as it were, that was set out on the desk at the time of planning and funding a project. So I believe that we do have to, I, I come back to pragmatism, I come back to flexibility. I think as situations on the ground evolve, as circumstances arise, which perhaps were not anticipated, then we've got to be flexible and we've got to adjust. So I think sticking rigidly to the original plan, there's a danger that you're gonna miss the subtle dynamic of, of the circumstances on the ground, both from a, a societal and political point.
point of view. So I think as long as things are well benchmarked, as long as things are well accounted for, change of that nature is entirely foreseeable and entirely acceptable as well. Okay, so I mean, I'll add to that just to, just because to, I, um, a colleague, uh, Peter Faircloth, uh, um, distinguished economist in our, in our field, his rule of thumb was basically you, if you double the cost and you half the revenues, does the project still work? Uh, now it's quite a brutal analysis to do, and very few projects would meet that mark. And uh, and, and uh, it's not necessarily the the uniform test, but uh, as a practitioner, if you want to feel on the, on the safe side, because I mean there are currency fluctuations can make a huge difference to uh, uh, to to to, pro to project uh, uh, performance. Definitely, when you have loan payback periods as well, um, cost recovery takes a lot of time in terms of uh, recovery of costs from from the public. It, it rolls with the political cycle also so those are those are difficult things now we've got 10 minutes to go um, so we're we're, we're, we're going in, you know um, very nicely on there in terms of the uh, the, the pragmatism of uh, in your project design and in the work you do Mike um, yeah. I mean do you do you purposely uh, jack down the costs as 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 much as much as possible in order to not burden systems or do you how do you gauge these things i think i think the starting point which again is often overlooked is what is the affordability within the host community mm. again banks and everybody else very often um, will go into it We'll come up with a project, we'll come up with a cost and repayments and the repayment loan period. And, and missing from that equation very often is what is affordable and what is sustainable. Now, I'm sure you've seen it, Andy, and Brian would have seen it, just how much money is wasted on international waste management projects. And in an earlier phase of my career, I was employed for a period of time by the World Bank. And my task, or one of my tasks, was to review the amount of money spent in waste management infrastructure development projects and where they failed, which sadly they often fail, is try to determine what is the key factor that has made them fail. And more times than not, the most common cause of failure of these projects was an inadequate level of attention paid on affordability and cost recovery. So paybacks of loans are often hampered, sometimes become impossible quite simply because the issue of cost recovery, the, char the, the charging of, for example, of waste management fees, the level of affordability, how those fees are gonna be collected, a lack of attention on that is from my experience the leading cause of, of failure of waste management projects, whether it be new waste collection, new vehicles, new landfill site. So that kind of goes back and, and links a little bit to the question of um, payback periods and flexibility. And again, if nothing else, if, if we could get the, the international agencies to start paying more attention to the host community, bottom up type approaches, what do they want? what's affordable and what's sustainable, then we would find a lot less of these projects actually failing in the long run. And indeed, I'm sure you'd lend to that as well. It's, you know, the international agencies come and go. They are... Don't they? they, are, Don't they, are they? Foreign, and they're also uh, competing with each other in the same terrain uh, 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 to a certain extent. You know, it's, uh, it, it is a, also an industry sector. At the end of the day, then it's the national governments, the ministries of finance that set set the budgetary procedures and set the financial conditions under which municipalities may operate sure. in any case and the levels of subsidies and uh, and, and, and and capital grants which uh, they can put I, you know I, I know from uh, uh, work uh, that you know the, the the people politicians do not like increasing taxes it doesn't matter where they are uh, in, yeah. in, in government yeah. which level of government whether it's uh, federal national uh, provincial or, 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 or especially local so alternative funding mechanisms uh, are, are you know rather than going direct charging to the household through you know property taxes or or, or uh, uh, you know 
uh, there are you know environmental charges uh, or levies for example you know you, I know for that you uh, tried to lobby for an environmental levy levy in, uh, in Caribbean countries on the from the tourism port shipping industry in order which to try and bridge this in the long run very successful very successful but again it's not just about increasing the cost of fees to the householder because there's a lot of things missing and I find it time and time again one of the things missing is for good reason the communities the residents don't trust the politicians whether you're talking about at the municipal level or at the state level or the national level so if you're going to increase fees you have to increase accountability transparency good governance as we did in Guyana I think there's an argument for ring fencing waste management fees don't collect fees which go into the consolidated fund and can't be accounted for ring fence waste management fees put them into that account and publish your accounts regularly so people can see what's been paid in and how the fees have been paid so there's a whole world of things that have to be done in terms of cost recovery and financial sustainability Mike we've got a good question in here from Luca uh, he's 31 or she, she I don't know Luca that could run both ways there uh, 31 years old and I left a company I was working with for five years because I wanted to embrace in the challenge of working in the waste management sector. So he's left his job, wants to join, come into the industry, try to work, wants to make a change in the world and finally you know, orient his capabilities towards the sector. But he doesn't have the experience. How would you suggest he goes about this? How do, you, know, how do you get into the work? Where, where does he start from? What would be the first action to take? Would you take a specialized course, try and get an intern program in UN or other multilateral agencies, or, or better focus on industries and their related waste management act activities, which I, I presume means you know getting inside you know, as, a, as, a, as a, in your local area in, as an operator. In sure, sure. Yeah, I, I can respond to that from the international perspective, working in, in the, um, the development sector. Uh, so Lucas has worked for a period of time, was it five years or something like that? So yeah. already Lucas has five years of experience um, and within the waste management sector many of the skills that you need are transferable from other sectors whether it's industry, commerce, government. So you know it's about are you a communicator as Andy said identifying your strength are you a communicator are you a technology person are you a hands-on community type person? there are many many openings now if you're sitting in Europe for example and you're wanting to get involved in the development sector in Asia in Africa very difficult because it comes back to this thing about what's your experience in developing countries and the way that I have encouraged younger people to to bridge that gap in the past is take a long-term view on it i've encouraged and have facilitated younger people being involved in project management at the central area and in the field but sometimes you know you, you have to take a hit financially to win that experience so indeed when i was young i offered myself to be involved in things at no cost at no salary just cover you know just cover my living expenses for example for three or six months so that I could gain experience have something on my CV which was of worth and of value and I've encouraged a number of young people to do likewise if your skill set if your experience isn't immediately tangible to the employer or the development agency offer your services on a no-cost basis for three or six months and people would be receptive to that, such as the United Nations Environment Program. I facilitated a number of people who came in uh, as uh, project assistants on a voluntary basis. After six months, their chances of getting a job either within the UN or the development sector are enhanced massively by that hands-on experience. So you haven't, they haven't, you might not earn money for that period of time, but there's going to be a very long payback period thereafter when you've acquired that experience that is so essential in the field. I think that's uh, that's uh, good advice there, Mike. We got we're running out of time. We've got a got a, a few seconds to go. We've got less than a minute, and uh, I, you know I, 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 I'd echo that uh, uh, and say that you know the 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 issues and challenges which we are facing and which are being faced uh, uh, are not going away quickly. In fact, they're intensifying. This is a, a, a long-term industry. It's with a, with a whole a whole future to it, 
Uh, it's worth getting stuck in. It certainly hasn't done us too badly, Mike. We've kept ourselves interested and involved. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best on that one. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, hmm? I, I say from my side, I would certainly encourage people, be they young or old, with a passion, with an environmental passion, a passion for public health and development to, to get involved. Because one thing I have never been in over my 30 years, I've never yet been bored. And I'm sure, Andy, you would attest to the same. It's, it's never boring, it's challenging, it's dynamic, it's exciting, and you never know what's gonna come around the corner and hit you next. Indeed, so on that one, thanks very much, Mike. Um, we was pretty soft on you there, actually, mate. It was so, very soft. Uh, I hope I Thank get, you. you know, so, passing back to Ranjith. It's appreciated. Thanks, Lance. Um, great. Uh, thank you very much, Mike and Annie. That, that was an uh, incredible discussion. Um, I learned a lot um, from it. So, um, let me um, uh, introduce my uh, our next two guests, uh, Chris Zerbrug and uh, Simon Houghton. And um, uh, let me just say goodbye to Andy and Mike. Um, you could stay on the stream, but I'll hide you from the broadcast. So, um, Absolutely. thanks again for joining, and um, yeah. Have a, have a good day. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's do that, um, friends. Give me um, just one minute to um, get this going. Um, Chris and Simon, can you unmute yourself? Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Jeff. How are you? Hey Simon, how are you? Um, Chris, um, let me otherwise help you there a little bit. Uh, control room. Okay, Chris. Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay, uh, okay thanks. Great. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you just close this. Um, hello, friends. So um, to, uh, now we have um, Chris Zobrug and uh, Simon Houghton with us. Um, Chris works at uh, Sandek EWAG, uh, which has been doing amazing work uh, when it comes to um, solving waste management issues in developing countries, uh, not just waste management, but also sanitation and water issues in, in developing countries. And Simon works with a company called AgriProtein, uh, which is building um, black soldier fly larvae um, waste treatment um, um, plants, and that will pretty large scale plants. Um, uh, so, so I welcome both of you, and uh, and um, so uh, today we'll, we'll talk about black soldier flies. Um, the reason we chose this topic was um, I, I um, so um, I was introduced to this topic mainly by um, Andy, and uh, then spoke to multiple consultants, and uh, all of them uh, were very hopeful that this technology could be a real um, addition to the toolkit that waste management already have. This is an additional tool that could work very well in the waste management toolkit in developing countries and also in, in, develop, in the developed world. So, um, so uh, w welcome, Chris. Uh, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about your work, about the guide that you've published, about the videos that you have on YouTube, and um, a little bit about the technology itself? Yeah, love to. Thanks. Um, you hear me? Everything's fine? Everything's fine, yeah. yeah. OK. So, um, so I come from a research institution. Uh, EAVAG is a, is a research center. Uh, and in our department, we actually focus on, on water sanitation and waste management in low-income income countries or low-income settings. And um, so first of all, what we have to say is that our research is very applied research. So we're always trying to look at kind of solutions. On one hand, solutions to existing problems. Um, but also then in a way in terms of visions, you know, what can be developed further, wh where do we see kind of the world moving towards and what kind of we kind of anticipate and look for, look for um, solutions. And so in organic waste management, we've been working for ages, um, especially, I mean, as you all know, organic waste as a, as a largest fraction in developing country settings. Uh, so if we can find some ways of managing organic waste, then, of course, we can solve a big, pro uh, big chunk of the problem. And so we went through composting. We did a lot of work on decentralized composting. We worked on anaerobic digestion, biogas production. And, and, and we're always kind of our, our push forward was always to find ways where we can increase the value of the organic material. 
Uh, as many of you know, compost in most settings, not all settings, but many settings has very low value. Uh, so it's kind of very difficult to get some revenue stream out of, out of this product that we're making from organic waste. So this compost product. So gas is much better. Uh, has, a, has a higher potential in terms of energy and fuel, but still also faces limitations. First of all, gas is kind of difficult to transport uh, and to store. And then, of course, it faces kind of severe difficulties um, because energy is often very strongly subsidized, has very low cost, a low price. So competing with el electricity, like from the, the grid, uh, makes it very difficult. And so biogas works often and we, where we see it very successful is in, in off-the-grid systems like Nepal, very rural Nepal settings that are not on the grid. That where, that's where biogas works ex in an excellent way. And, but we were kind of, we were searching for more opportunities in the urban setting, uh, not really rural off-grid systems. And then we came across Balak soldier flies. And, and there, of course, um, and um, I'm sure, you know, Simon would agree, you know, there's a lot of potential in terms of the product. So product protein as feed, uh, animal feed. So animal consumption, meat consumption is increasing worldwide. Um, f oceans are being fished out. There are less and less fish. And actually that fish meal is often used for animal feed or so is soya. Uh, soya is used for animal feed. But of course, soya needs a lot of land, uh, intense uh, also irrigation, so water consumption. So trying to find alternatives, on one way, trying to find an alternative for the, the problem of, of animal feed, and at the same time, finding a, a, a great alternative to solve, solve the organic waste problem. So also manage organic waste in a better way, and then kind of combine this together to make a product of value. Um, so our approach, and, and um, Simon will probably say, will come from a different angle. Our approach is, of course, from a research, a research point of view. So our mandate is to really make um, the material, the knowledge available to as many people as possible. Uh, we are trying to focus more on a small sector, on a micro, small and micro enterprise sector. Um, and because we think... Um, rapid replication all over and as, in as many cities as possible, even on neighborhood or um, city region scale, um, you know, if people see the opportunity of, of getting, of making some, making profit, making a business out of it, that, that can drive waste management. And, and then, so waste management does not become um, the, the objective of waste management does not is not only protecting public health and environment, but suddenly is doing that, and in addition also uh, making some making some some money. So that's kind of our starting point, and maybe I'll talk about it later about our our projects. But we've been working now on on black soldier flies. Um, mm -hmm. I would say off and on for for about eight eight to ten years. Uh, started off with a PhD um, thesis, looking at it in more detail and then kind of going on from there. And now the research continues, but we're, we're at a stage where we really think we have a lot of information to share. And you mentioned it, we just recently published a step-to-step -step guide on really the operational, proce uh, operational procedures. And we, kind of, we try to set it up in a way like a cookbook recipe. So you, it really kind of tells you what to do, step one, you know, what to mix, similar to Jamie Oliver's cookbooks, where they tell you first press out, press out the lime, then mix it with the, with the tomatoes. And, you know, so really going step by step. We also have material lists of what to buy. Of course, that can vary from country to country, but we kind of give like a, a template. Um, and a, and we, we accompany the book um, with a small little video. Uh, you can see that on you can download or, or watch it on YouTube, or you can, uh, you can also download the book uh, free of charge from our site. So that's kind of the, at the level we are. And at the moment, we're very much in this dissemination phase of, of course, one approach of how to do it. Um, you know, anyone, everyone can do it a bit differently. So there are variations in how to do it. But we felt we, had, we have proven with our, with our site, with our facility in Indonesia, that this works. 
So we felt, okay, this is the time to publish this and to make, make people aware of this is, this is how you can do it and it works. We know it works. So why not make it um, public knowledge? Right, right. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, that's such a very good context and kind of a pitch for, for um, the technology and the process. And um, so, um, Simon, welcome and um, welcome. Um, everyone on the, on the session today um, has been here earlier on previous Global Dialogues, but uh, you're the first okay. person who hasn't been, so welcome uh, and thanks thank for joining you. us. And um, so, uh, since uh, you know, Chris uh, put a very good context and you know, kind of a pitch for for, for you know the Black Soldier Flight Technology. So, could you talk a little bit about what you're doing, you the, the scale you're operating it, and the regions and geographies that you're focused on right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, firstly, we 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 would encourage uh, the small scale um, expansion of, of of using the Black Soldier Flight as a technology. Um, we've just pitched ourselves as a business to, to essentially solve a, a, a global problem um, as a business. And there are two issues that we have pitched ourselves at. One is the organic waste issue, and the other is the protein gap. Um, Agri-protein has been going about nine years. We have spent an incredible amount of time learning the biology. Uh, it's one thing rearing black soldier fly in a lab sort of size but to get them to um, breed and lay eggs uh, on a large scale, and I'm talking sort of a thousand cages, um, 365 days of the year um, across the globe is, isn't another thing entirely. Um, typically a black soldier fly will only really mate and lay eggs um, in the spring and summer months. So, and that is because of the frequency of light um, that is that is uh, expressed over the curvature of the globe. So we spent a long time mimicking that frequency of light to um, arrive at a situation where we could pretend that it was uh, summer 365 days of the year. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time coming out of a laboratory and into a large scale factory. We've made infinite number of mistakes. Um, Recently, we, we uh, acquired a new shareholder. It's public knowledge who that is. It's uh, Christoph Industries in Austria. And they came to the DD in our business. And we've got large components of the biology to a point where we could industrialize them. Um, but we didn't have the engineering capability. Since then, they've come in and developed a Greenfields uh, engineering design, which we can deliver on an EPC basis um, anywhere in the world. Um, typically, these plants take in about 250 tons a day of organic waste, which equates to about 100,000 tons a year. So we are able to offer a city that has roughly a population of over a million people. We can offer them a waste disposal facility that can consume 100,000 tons of organic waste a year. Um, if you look at the uh, waste hierarchy pyramid, we've, we believe that we've pitched ourselves sort of in the reusing and recycling of, of, of food waste. So we think that our solution keeps food in the food chain, um, unlike obviously landfill or even biodigestion. Um, let me talk a little about the global um, rollout. So we have in the next year to 18 months, we have sites opening up in Saudi Arabia, Johannesburg, which is our home country, uh, Vietnam, Dubai, um, South Korea. Uh, and um, we planning, we're gonna go through a series of capital raises over the next year or so. And we plan to have a hundred of these plants up and running within a 10 year period. It's something that we're extremely excited about. I work with an incredibly passionate team. And um, on the product side, um, each factory will produce about 5,000 tons of protein, 3,000 tons of oil, and about 45,000 tons of composting feedstock, which is, we use a wet harvesting uh, methodology. So it's more of a slurry, which can be used either to pelletize as fertilizer or can be um, sent to composting farms. Um, there's another whole project development going on in terms of 
creating compost that becomes part of the soil inoculation uh, market, which is a newfound uh, research program. So that is, in a nutshell, what we're about. Right, right, great. Thank you, um, um, Simon. So, um, Chris, uh, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the, you know, the, the bees themselves? You know, um, we talked about this during the test run, um, where they're native in the world, because I think this would be one question that many people would have. At least I thought it would be a big issue. Um, so, where where they live, where they're indigenous, and then also talk about what they eat and um, and uh, what about all the portion that they don't eat? Um, you know, how, how do we yep. deal with that? And wh while you're doing that, can you also compare it with composting, whether it's a, uh, Simon um, in our test run mentioned that it's not a competition, but um, could you um, talk about that uh, a little bit? Yeah, love to. So um, in a way, in terms of um, where they're spread out, they're, they're practically global. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're endemic in all temperate zones. So, of course, not in the cold regions. So, for instance, in Switzerland, uh, the northern part of the Alps, uh, where it's colder in the winters, they, they don't live in the wild. Uh, they are, they are uh, endemic in, in the southern part of Switzerland, so where, they can, where can they, they can survive the winter. And I think, um, in a way, so it's, it, I would say in most countries, it's not an issue of, of you know, introducing a new species you can actually collect them in the wild um, and you can start your colony uh, from a wild population if you wish to uh, so there I think that kind of maybe covers those concerns of you know introducing new species into a into an ecosystem which might have some damaging consequences um, you, can, you, you can also you can also farm them in in uh, in, the, in I would say in a context where they're not endemic, but of course, then you have some certain regulations you have to fulfill. So, for instance, in our in our lab setting or in our in our setting in in Zurich, to fulfill certain criteria of multiple barriers, we have to keep them indoors so they cannot escape. So, you 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 can also get you can also get permits to do that. It just gets a bit more complicated. Um, and in the in the I would say in the in the temperate tropical zone, I mean, they, what they really like is temperatures above 24 degrees up to 30. Um, you know, the 25, 30 range, that's where they, that's, they love that. And, um, and then on, in the different life stages, they have different, different requirements. And uh, I mean, Simon uh, probably mentioned that it's quite, it's tricky to get, you know, to understand their life cycle and to, to learn about their life cycle. Uh, and to get those skills of how to engineer the life cycle. Uh, but once you can kind of get that, and that's, that's what we also with our book try to kind of um, transmit as well, is, is that complexity of the life cycle. Um, and your other question was what they, what they eat. So in a way, they eat food, food, um, food waste. That's excellent stuff. Um, there, are, there is information on what they prefer to eat and what they don't. What we know is that they can't, they can't eat uh, woody waste, so highly um, cellulosic, lignosic waste. They have difficulties because they just don't have the mouth parts to digest it. So you would have to, yeah, you would have to include a pretreatment step to break it down. What we usually do in our in our facilities is we we chop we chop all the waste. Um, they they can in terms of moisture ranges, they like it moist. And Simon was saying they have like a wet, a wet feeding system, more like a slurry. Uh, we noticed that there, there is a limit. So when, when they start swimming too much in the waste, they don't develop as fast. Now that might, that might be a trade-off of using a, a slurry in terms of operational processes that, you know, is easier to manage because then you can pump the stuff and, and it, there are some, and, and so you, that's a trade-off and you say, okay, then they, do, they might not develop as fast but at least it's easier to manage. So you can, you can take that trade off. We noticed we're trying to follow a bit of approach where we, if it's too wet, we dewater the waste just by gravity. We just let it, let the water seep out a bit, uh, or we kind of have a, a waste mixture, which, which is not too, too wet. And that facilitates our, our, our residue, the, the stuff that remains. So the food, the, the waste that is consumed it's a bit easier to manage from our from our perspective. 
because you can compost it, you can you can kind of shovel it. It's 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 more easy easy to 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 use in in the later stage. Um, what else? I think there are some different substances where we see what they like more and what they like less. Uh, we also did uh, work with excreta because, of course, we'd like to explore the sanitation market as well or the 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 option to use excreta. So what they grow less on, on wastewater sludge. Um, and that seems logical because there's less, less protein, less food in, in a digested sludge. Uh, they also, excreta, they, they grow well. So you can also feed them excreta. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So uh, slaughterhouse waste, they love right. slaughterhouse waste. Um, and but of course there you have the issue of of meat waste, uh, you know, and and called the whole cycle of of food and meat waste. We don't think it's much of a problem. I think that probably needs a bit more research in terms of risk risk components. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you, um, um, Simon. Uh, so um, uh, based on my test runs with both of you, I mean, I hear a lot of consensus here on you know the. Um, the um, the technology and process. So, Simon, um, do you have any comments or thoughts on um, what um, Chris um, spoke about, or or should we move to the next question? No, I just wanted to correct uh, Chris, and just in terms of what I was saying earlier, I was saying that we have a wet harvesting methodology in terms of how we harvest the oh, lava, okay. which 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 by by default creates a wet slurry to be used as compost. Our feeding plant, which we which we call Lava Lunch, is is a has a high moisture content. It's about seventy percent up to seventy five percent maximum, and um, we obviously want to put our plants down in areas where we can harness uh, as much waste as we can. And if there would be at any site, typically a one way stream that is dominant, whether it's a brewer's grain or chicken manure. I was speaking to a client yesterday. They have a chicken farm that has a thousand tons a day of chicken manure. We can include that into the lava diet, but only to an inclusion rate of about 30%. But typically, a black soldier fly is very similar to humans. They require 10 to 15% of protein, 70% carbohydrate. They need a lipid uh, portion and a fat portion as well as a fiber portion. So you do get different bioconversions. And when you put a big plant up, our plants are typically $30 million uh, units. Uh, the the bioconversion rate is a key number for us. So we try to get as close as we can to our maximum bioconversion because that relates back to the products that we sell. On the basis that we earn a gate fee for disposing of the waste, which it's 90% of the cases we do, uh, we're not too concerned about the about the bioconversion because then we are simply a waste treatment plant. Um, so that we can move on, that's pretty much it. Okay, okay, great, wonderful. And um, Simon, so uh, when we spoke last time, you, um, uh, you said that um, this is not a technology that will compete with others, but then it's kind of, kind of fits very well in the hierarchy or with existing waste management systems like composting. So um, can you um, talk, very quickly say where it fits and you know how it fits and uh, then also talk a little bit about um, are there any border problems um, from you know a system like this um, I, I imagine there will not be but uh, in practice um, are there any odor problems uh, from this time? are there any odor problems right yeah sure I think when you're dealing with with any any organic waste um, particularly mixtures of organic waste uh, you will have an odor problem. In our plant here in Cape Town, we try to minimize it, but if we don't manage it on a daily basis and we don't have someone that's, you know, looking after it, um, there is an odor problem. Um, but it's you manage it like any other engineering process. Um, in terms of, uh, what was the other question you asked me? Um, so uh, in terms of where it fits in the existing uh, infra yeah, waste. So I made reference to to the waste hierarchy, which is a, uh, a basically a management structure as to how we should handle food and drink and organic waste as a, as a species. And it starts off with the most desirable way to handle it, which is to either prevent it or reuse it to the least desirable um, way to treat it, which is to put it onto a landfill site, which we all know have 
various environmental um, repercussions. So we sit, I think, in my own opinion, in the reusing and the recycling band of that, uh, of that waste hierarchy. Um, I was also, also asking with existing infrastructure, with composting, how could it work together with composting? You know, um, that was the question. Right. Okay. So, so we have a, an in-vessel composting business next to our site here in Cape Town. And they are adjacent to a fruit and vegetable market. One of their problems is they accept the fruit and veg uh, waste on a daily basis, which provides them with an inconsistent waste stream. Because some days there's a lot more fruit, other days there's a lot more green and leafy uh, waste. And essentially what lands up happening is it has a, a, a down-the-line domino effect in his in-vessel composting. So what we've done is we take the, um, the fruit and veg waste, produce lava lunch, because we can use that up to an inclusion of about 80%, and then we provide him back the um, mag slurry, which is highly active. It's been digested through the gut of, of, of lava. It's almost a 422 makeup in terms of nitrogen, potassium, and, and uh, phosphate. And he has a very stable feedstock that he can work with in his business. So it's a very sim it's a very worthwhile symbiotic relationship between our business and his. And it's something that I see us rolling out um, with every one of our plants across the globe. Right, right. Okay. Um, um, and next, I would like to uh, discuss markets markets with you. But before that, um, I'll ask um, Chris a little bit about um, uh, you know what kind of um, uh, response are you seeing for for your guide and for for your um, uh, uh, you know the knowledge products that you've put out there. You know who are responding and what kind of response are you seeing to them? Yeah, uh, very good response. Uh, lots of response. It's a bit overwhelming. We need to kind of um, back down a bit because we are we have to still continue in managing our projects. And if we uh, well, if we only respond to res to uh, to questions, um, uh, I think then we'll do nothing else. So we we could probably just open a consultancy, just <laughs> consulting mm -hmm. on, on people wanting to 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 put this into operation, which we're not doing. But so um, what what we have now set up in Indonesia is because there's our, our target focus from the project in Indonesia is, of course, on Indonesia. That's kind of defined by our donor. We would like to support the Indonesian waste management context as a higher priority. And of course, our research objectives are to go to also uh, provide the information globally. But from a project perspective, it's, it's mainly focused on Indonesia. And there, we're, we're setting up a system that people that are interested, um, they have different options, either they can, they can do internships on our facility, so they can come and visit, they can see how it's done. They can, uh, they can either just come for a day or they can do a one month of, of, of internship, so where, they, where they're kind of included in our daily processes, so they learn every step of the way, they learn the whole life cycle. And, and maybe that's important to mention, um, and, and that's a bracket here, uh, just to mention this, what we feel is, you know, the skills, the skill set that are needed to really operate something like this, uh, they're quite significant. And Simon was also saying it, you need to learn a lot about the life cycle. Uh, the, the flies, you know, how to make sure that you always have larvae, uh, small larvae ready that you can, you can give, give waste to, uh, making sure that you have enough eggs, that the, that the flies mate, you know that cycle is 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 a bit more complex. You need you need to know about the life cycle of the flies. You need to know what the conditions are, what what things what what goes if something goes wrong, how you can adapt, how you can how you can um, you know find some solutions. That's the that's a more tricky part where you need more skills on the waste side, on the waste treatment side. So once you do have the small larvae, and you have a good waste supply then you know feeding the larvae with waste is pretty straightforward we have we have a daily routine of what how how much you feed per day in what kind of density we do this in crates so that can actually that doesn't need that much skills 
I mean, of course, it needs some skills, but it's not so complex as the nursery. Right. So we're trying to provide more the internships and the knowledge uh, on the hands-on experiences on the nursery part. And right. that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. Okay. Uh, we're, what, we're, what we're also providing is for those people that are interested, like starter packages. So right. they, can, they're like, they can get from us like a, a, a set of a certain amount of small larvae and where they can start um, the rearing process themselves. Um, I'm really interested in understanding, you know, um, how you're doing what Simon uh, was saying about the life cycle, you know, um, creating summer throughout the year. But uh, we have only 15 minutes and I really want to get to the markets and the sourcing part of it. Um, so, um, Simon, could you talk a little bit about the markets for your products um, and, um, and, and, and the demand that you have and how, how do you choose markets, etc. Could, could you talk about that a little bit? And then we'll go to Chris to talk about the sourcing of the waste because I know that that's a major problem in developing countries for the sourcing. Please go ahead, Simon. So we have three products. The, the most bulky one is our, is our composting um, product, which we call Mag Soil. Uh, that is a localized product. You, because we're producing roughly 80 tons a day of it per plant, we have to sell that locally. So we develop those markets on a per site basis. In terms of our mag meal and the mag oil product, the mag meal is destined for the aquaculture industry. We're dealing with um, the top three or four aquaculture uh, feed suppliers. We have trials ongoing with them. And um, if we just only service that market, um, we still won't build enough factories to service it. On the oil side, we, if we, even if we sell it as a, as a, for its calorific value, as, as, as an energy source, we would have hit our target price. It has cosmetic value, believe it or not. Um, it, it's very high in lauric acid. And it really is going to be a question of how we desensitize um, the market uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. We have another business which uh, uh, Christian was uh, leading to earlier on um, called the BioCycle, which is funded by the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation, which we feed black soldier fly on, on human fecal matter. That leaves us with a, uh, another product which is very similar to activated carbon. It has an incredible ability to retain um, uh, scents and um, we are doing studies with some of the leading um, sanitation businesses worldwide uh, to create products there. So and back to agri-protein in terms of our oil and, uh, and our mag meal, we are currently focusing on, on the aqua industry. So salmon, shrimp, um, not so much tilapia, um, caviar market, uh, so we have a, we have an overwhelming demand for products that we produce and we have uh, any number of organizations attempting to take a hundred percent of our production. It's not good business sense to give any client a hundred percent. So we sort of navigating those waters, uh, on an ongoing basis. Wonderful. That's, that's amazing to learn that uh, we could finally find products, uh, markets for products made of organic waste, uh, which has been- Well, you see, you see, nobody's ever mass reared insects. So if yeah. you want to start supplying a big enterprise like Cargill, for instance, they, they would like a global supplier. You can't be an agri-protein and only be in Africa and hope to supply Cargill. They want to know that over a period of 10 years, you will develop into a global supply chain. Otherwise, you technically can't uh, do business with them. And all of these big players, kind of whether you deal with the Mars Corporation, Nestle, any of the big pet food companies outside of Mars, you will land up with the same problem. You need to be a global player. Yeah, right. that, that, that's very insightful. Um, so um, uh, I'll just uh, remind um, viewers that um, we were watching Chris Zerbrug and uh, Simon Houghton uh, talk about black soldier fly larvae. Um, this is a new, um, not a new, but uh, it's a very uh, interesting uh, new tool in the waste management toolkit. And um, if you have any questions, um, use the Q&A box uh, below the screen and um, send them in. 
And uh, you can also tweet to us at uh, BeWasteWise, or you can use the hashtag WasteDialogue. And uh, we have um, another session coming up tomorrow called the Collective Action. Uh, we believe a large um, global challenges like waste can only be solved when all of us take um, steps towards you know, solving it. So for collective action, we're bringing in uh, people working on environmental justice, environmental racism, and we're also bringing in um, two teenagers who founded a, a nonprofit. And we're also, uh, we also have Marcus Erickson talk about his um, um, book called um, uh, Junk, uh, uh, well, uh, about his book um, called uh, Junkraft. I think that, I can't remember the name right now, but uh, uh, it, it talks about the rising uh, tide of activism. So um, um, tune in tomorrow, you can register on the website and you can do, th do that. Um, but uh, let, let's go back to um, Chris and then um, talk a little bit about the sourcing of the waste because that's a real problem in, um, uh, in developing countries, mainly on how you could source that um, uh, um, high quality organic waste. So um, Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it's something that we, we see that we, we're also facing um, in a way in Indonesia. So in Indonesia, our facility takes uh, vegetable and uh, we're, so we're attached to a vegetable market and a fruit, uh, fruit market. So we're getting quite well sorted, I would say very nicely sorted vegetable and fruit waste. So actually, and we did that on purpose because we didn't want to get too much into the waste sourcing in terms of, because we were, we were interested in developing the process of, of, of um, with the flies uh, and with the larvae. So, but now uh, it kind of, it, it comes to the point where you say, okay, um, if you, if you cherry pick the good waste, the easy to access waste from maybe fruit industry um, or from such vegetable markets, of course, that's easy waste to access. So quite at a low cost, um, it's, it's already well sorted. So it has, I would say, a high quality in terms of, of waste quality, which then of course leads also to the quality of the larvae. Um, but now the question is, you know, if you really want to make uh, a change in waste management, in municipal solid waste management, which where we know the biggest mass of waste is actually household waste. That's, that's the big chunks of waste, you know, uh, is, is household waste. So now the question is, how can you get the organic fraction from the households? And that is, of course, a big challenge. Uh, it's a big challenge because then you start need to, you need to engage with uh, campaigning. You need to awareness uh, was mentioned in the sessions before. You know you need to start going onto the community level, trying to motivate and convince households to segregate at the source, so that you can access that organic fraction. Unless you decide to sort everything on your facility, at, like post ante sorting which of course increases, increases your cost tremendously uh, of manual sorting or even mechanical sorting and reduces the quality because you'll always have um, contaminants in it. So, so there I just, I noticed that, you know, the whole sector of black soldier fly operation, waste treatment operation, um, in a way it really needs a collaboration with the government. Because if you really want to work on this community level, if you want to organize a household segregation, that, that necessitates an involvement of the municipality, of the communities. So really then you can't, you can't kind of go independent. You have to work together with the municipalities. We were lucky in Surabaya now to really get the city interested. So they, were, they, they visited our site, the, the waste management department visited our site and said, okay, this is something uh, we're already engaging on household waste segregation in different communities. Now, would that be an option that we use your treatment option on that organic waste? Because we don't have much space and composting needs quite a lot of space. We would like to reduce our, our space footprint. Black soldier fly is actually ideal because you can, you can manage it vertically. And, and so, so this collaboration came up now that we're kind of giving them technical expertise to, which, as I said before, is quite simple, which could even be in the neighborhood where they, get, where they have household segregated waste. And then we can think of a, of a model where 
the nursery is off-site in a more central location, which supplies the small larvae. The treatment happens in the neighborhoods, and then the large larvae, when they've grown, are again collected. So rather than transporting waste, we're transporting the larvae, central facility. That means the central facility would rear, uh, would supply lar small larvae, collect large larvae, process and market the larvae. And the waste management, so the larvae treatment, waste treatment, would happen in the neighborhoods, con connected to a community initiative with uh, waste segregation. So that would also kind of motivate the people to see, okay, this is what's happening with my waste. This is why I'm doing it, you know, to kind of get the level of motivation to do actually this, this job. So it, it could even, we could even think about models of financial incentives, you know, that they're, that they're getting something back for the community in this exchange for growing the larvae. So we, I think this is a very exciting model, but it really needs this community level, this municipality engagement. And, and because we really need, uh, uh, we need, uh, sorry, my, my screen just went cockeyed there. Uh, and we really need this involvement with, uh, and we need good waste. We need household segregated waste. And then we can make a, a big uh, impact on, on waste management for the whole city because we can replicate this scheme throughout the city. Right, right. Thanks, Chris. Um, as you fix the screen, I'll, I'll move to um, Simon. And um, Simon, so um, how, where do you source your waste? I mean, so can you quickly say, um, you know, where, where you source your waste and, um, and if you have any comments on what Chris said until now? So we are tooled up to um, accept municipal solid waste. Um, and I agree, it's a, it's a massive problem in terms of separating it and decontaminating it. Uh, but ultimately, we know that's where the final game will be. Uh, in some countries, it's a lot easier to accept it than others. Uh, various municipalities are way ahead of the game in comparison to others. Uh, for example, South Korea, probably the most advanced. They have a reverse vending system where households uh, put their organic waste into little bags and put them into vending machines. They're charged a fee, and then the, the city essentially auctions the waste off and pays the... Um, disposal company to do that. Um, we, we're also geared up to take on industrial waste. Our Saudi Arabian plant will be put into an industrial site where there's many, many hundreds of tons of waste, uh, whether it's from a bakery, um, uh, uh, chip manufacturers. We have a site in, in Johannesburg where just one industrial site produces 70 tons a day of potato peels. So we, we geared up to take post and pre-consumer waste. Uh, we know that uh, modern cities have placed um, targets to have zero waste or 50% less waste to landfill by certain dates. So we're going to be right there to participate in the organic fraction of that. And it does, it boils down to awareness and consciousness in, in, in every household to, you know, separate the waste. And I think that'll come over time. Um, so, and there are companies that are doing it successfully currently, um, waste companies that we're plugging into at the moment. But it'll, it will evolve over time. I think it will get better rather than worse. Right, right. Okay. And um, do you have any final comments? And then we'll move to Chris. Uh, we have only two minutes, so. No, no, I'm good. We can, we can move to Chris. Okay, all right, wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us, Simon. And uh, Chris, um, any final thoughts? We have two minutes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll mute you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, actually not. I, I think it was it was it was great. Thanks for having me here. It was uh, great also to meet you, Simon. I think we'll probably have more exchange in the future. So that I'm excited to see what you are. And I mean, I think our our, our different our different approaches. What you were saying to, in terms of waste sourcing, I I completely agree. Uh, what we, t of course, see is that the more developed countries like South Korea, um, you know, they have these systems which are coming on, on household separation. The, mm. the countries that we're working in, unfortunately, um, are not so, that's not so well developed. So that's why I think there's, uh, there's some catching up to do. But I think if we can show the population, if we can show the people the benefit and what kind of, what the what value is created, 
and what the benefits are of, of making something out of this organic fraction, we can really also uh, attract attention to really separating waste and, and to make this possible. Absolutely. So that would be my, finally word, my final words, really. Okay, all right, great. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Simon, anything, but then um, we can end it here. Yeah, I know. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed participating. Um, thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Simon. Thanks, um, Chris. Thanks, Andy and Mike and Brian. Um, it was a great session today. Um, we heard from people from all around the world about, you know, um, practicing waste management and what kind of experience that they go through. And we have another session um, on a similar theme um, happening on the 8th of September. And you, you'll again hear from people around the world, um, you know, what kind of challenges they're facing and how they're overcoming them. And um, tomorrow we have, um, like I mentioned earlier, a session on collective action. And um, for those who are viewing, if, you, if you're learning anything from all of this and if you're liking what you're watching, then please share. And um, sharing is, you know, probably the first step, of, um, first step towards um, change and taking leadership. So do that. And um, again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, remember that, um, you know, we, we face planetary challenges, uh, our generation especially. And, uh, you know, all of us should be ready to, you know, take uh, leadership ahead. I'm um, sorry, take uh, leadership and then take a step ahead. And when you want to do that, whenever you're ready, um, I think Be Waste Wise will have the resources, the knowledge resources that will help you take the next step ahead, uh, uh, that will guide you take the next step. So um, thank you again and um, have a good day, good night and good evening, wherever you're in the world. So thanks, guys. <laughs>